So like we just give them, we give them a ton of Ambien and they can just use it when they, you know, there's no side effects to it. It's not habit forming. It's a good drug. And I was like, all right, like whatever. Let me go look into that. Um, but again, Western trained medical physician, I didn't know anything about sleep. Uh, I could have, you could have grabbed my gardener, uh, grabbed me and said, tell me everything you know about sleep. And we probably would have known about the same amount. Like I zero, I didn't knew nothing about sleep. I don't know what happens when you go to sleep. I don't know what's supposed to happen. Uh, I'd taken pharmacology. I knew what ambient was. I knew the mechanism of action, right? I knew that it was a GABA analog, which means it acts like GABA. Uh, but I honestly didn't know what GABA was supposed to be doing. For sleep. So it's like, I don't really know. Like, okay. I mean, it helps sleep because it acts like GABA and GABA is important for sleep. Why? I don't know. Um, so let me learn a little bit about sleep. Now, the problem with the pharmaceutical industry is when they go for FDA approval, they give the FDA the research, right? The FDA doesn't do the research. They give them the research. All right. So we are back and I am talking to a former SEAL turned doctor turned sleep expert, uh, Dr. Kurt Parsley. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, man. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. No problem. So as you, um, what, let's start with the basics. Um, you joined the Navy as enlisted or officer? Uh, enlisted. Okay. Yeah. So did you grow up in Texas or? I did. So were you always as a kid, uh, considering the military or did that great documentary that came out in the late eighties with, uh, Charlie Sheen <laughs> push you now, over there. No. So, um, so I grew up in Katy, Texas, which is now essentially like part of Houston. Um, when I grew up out there, it was, it was probably like 45 miles outside of Houston. You drove through like cow pastures for, you know, half an hour before you, before you turned off into my little town. So it was, it was kind of a, semi-rural town it had some neighborhoods in there some suburbs were popping up to uh feed the cities you know um but it, it was it was a it was a small little town there wasn't much to do you know we you know we parked our cars at the end of dead end roads and drank beer and listened to music with our headlights on you know like that kind of town and uh <clears throat> you know i i i never cared about uh school um just wasn't my bag of course you know I, today i would have been diagnosed with addhd but i was just a rambunctious little boy i was physical i was active i was strong and i liked i liked doing active strong fun hard things you know um so I, I was a terrible student um but i was a really good athlete so i did well enough in school to play sports and uh that was about it um i i did some martial arts i did some boxing my boxing coach was a marine recruiter was the Marine recruiter in my hometown. Um, and so we always just assumed I was going to go Marines force recon, you know, I wanted to do something like, you know, whatever the hardest thing was. And then, uh, ironically, the documentary I thought you were referring to, uh, I thought maybe you heard me say it. Um, there was a, a, uh, a journalism, uh, show like 60 minutes. It's called 48 hours. I don't know if you remember that back oh, yeah. in the eighties and nineties. And, uh, they covered uh, buds. They, they covered a, a seal a seal class or a buds class going through Hell Week, and they kept, you know, just showing all these really hard things they were doing, and uh, you know, kept saying, "Well, this is the toughest training in the world. It's the toughest training. It's the toughest training anywhere in the world. Toughest." And I'm like, "Well, that's what I want to do. I want to go do the toughest training in the world." I didn't even know what a seal was to be honest. Like, I just I saw that show and I watched that. I, I video, I, you know, when we had the VHS, I recorded it from whatever and i watched it like 20 times and over a couple of weeks and i went down uh to the recruiting office when my marine recruiter <laughs> wasn't there and i went into the navy office and told them i want to be a seal and they signed me up so uh, how so how disappointed was your boxing coach in here he was he was pretty upset <laughs> he was pretty upset. <laughs> and and to make to make matters worse about uh a week after that happened I, uh, I hadn't seen him in, in a week or so. And we went out to, you know, like some stupid street party where people are, you know, drinking beers and acting like high school kids. And I got in a fight with two guys from another school and, 
and just basically humiliated both of them. And uh, the next day I happened to be pulling up into the shopping center where the Marine or where the recruiting officer was and the Marine recruiter comes out and he says, Hey, I heard you joined the Navy. <laughs> I was like, yeah, <laughs> he goes, and I heard you beat up two of my Marines last night. <laughs> so I was like, uh, so our relationship's over. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> like, it's, it's done. <laughs> you're going to beat me up now? Because like, <laughs> uh, yeah, so, but, you know, I, I, I grew up in that kind of family, you know. Um, I'm like a 12th generation Texan, and uh, it's just kind of that that mindset of blue collar life. So, uh, like, every, you know, everybody does their, their service, you know. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be military. I mean, you can be law enforcement or firefighter or something, but you do, you know, you do something to support the the greater good, uh, the communities around you. And, um, and so, yeah, I, I just always assumed I would go there. I'd never, like I said, never had any interest in school. I actually dropped out of high school to join the Navy. Uh, I didn't, I didn't, didn't have any interest in going to school whatsoever, you know, and my, and I have a younger son who's just like me and I don't, I don't, uh, I don't try to talk him out of that, you know, like my, my oldest son is really academic. He's always liked school. He just graduated UCLA. Um, he loves it. My younger son's like, well, I'm just going to try to play division one football at some school. I don't care what school. And if I can't, then I'm just going to go to a trade school or I'm going to go to the military. Right. Cause I don't, I don't like school. <laughs> There's nothing I want out of college. I'm like, yeah. there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> you know, look, look at all this school debt they're trying to get paid back now because they, you know, they didn't make any, you know, it's was, it was a bad investment. Everybody knows it's a bad investment. So. Yeah. yeah. So when you joined, what year was that? 1987. Okay. So when you joined, um, the Navy still had what they called source rates for SEALs. So Corman, yeah. uh, yeah. boats yeah. mate. What did you come in as? I came in as a gunner's mate. Oh, really? Yeah. So I came in with the, uh, uh, I came in under the dive fair program. I don't know if you remember yeah. that. So the dive fair program basically gave you multiple chances to pass the test, like three chances to pass the test in, in, uh, boot camp, in case, you know, and then it also gave you a guaranteed billet at BUDS if you passed. Whereas if you you probably know, otherwise you can screen in boot camp and you can crush the test, but your gaining command has to let you go to go to BUDS. And a lot of times they don't. They say, now you got to come and work for two years and then you can go back, right? So the die fair program guaranteed you that shot at BUDS first uh, before you went to your gaining command, but you still had to go through A school. And all that right so um you know i was uh but again i grew up very blue collar and i worked construction and i you know had uncles that did electrical work and i learned how to do that and i learned how to <coughs> do carpentry and i learned how to do landscaping and i learned and i you know I, I took auto mechanics all through school i was asc certified in brakes and suspension when i was like 16 years old i worked at you know tire stores and you know like i was always just a mechanical dude and so you know, hydraulics and mechanics and gun systems just seemed like the right thing to me. And I, you know, and I, and I, was, and I grew up with guns and I like, you know, I liked guns and obviously it's going to be a seal. So I, you know, the more I knew about guns, the better. <laughs> it <laughs> and, made sense. And, uh, yeah. And then, you know, the irony was that when I went to, when I went to a school, uh, you know, you know, when, so I went through boot camp. Uh, so the die fair program gave you a couple of things that they gave you the guaranteed shot to go through or it gave you three chances to take the test in boot camp it gave you uh, a meritorious promotion to e3 out of boot camp and then it gave you uh, e4 out of a school um, but I got meritoriously promoted in boot camp anyway I passed the test on the first try and I graduated in the top of my class. I was the, I graduated at the top of my class in A school, so I would have gotten meritoriously promoted to E four, but they didn't give it to me. They gave it to the second place guy because I was getting it already. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so didn't really do much for me other than extend my enlistment a couple of years, but it you know it did give me that guaranteed shot to go. And I wouldn't have done well in the Navy, you know, because yeah. like uh, you know, despite how it might look from the outside, I'm not really good at following the rules just because they're the rules like the rules have to make sense to me um and uh that that's not compatible with 
uh, regular military life. It's okay for being a SEAL because you can raise your hand and bitch. Um, doesn't mean you won't get shut down, but you can at least raise your hand and bitch. Nobody, you know, nobody's going to throw you out for that. They're going to, they're going to respect that if it's, you know, if it's articulate, it makes sense. Um, and uh, being a doctor in the Navy is no different. It's like doctors aren't supposed to know anything about the military, right? They're just, they're meant to be doctors. Like you can wear your uniform wrong, like mess everything up, like not know how to salute. Like, you know, th nobody cares. Just like, go be a doctor, be yeah. a doctor. That's what we need you to do. So, you know, in that respect, I did, I did well. Cause had I, I, I mean, I, I look back now, it's like the Marines were the worst match for me ever. <laughs> so that was divine intervention. I mean, I would have, I would have, I would have been beaten down in the Marines cause uh, you know, I'm just outspoken. <laughs> no, no, no. And actually, uh, later we'll talk about that. The, uh, the other, the reason why I found you through another podcast and you had some pretty radical ideas on what's going on now. Um, yeah. and it, it, a lot of what you said back, I think it was what early 2020, mid 2020 on, on Paul's on Paul's podcast. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I want to say we were, we were only like, maybe three or four months into the pandemic when he and I did that. Yeah. And a lot of it, what you said then makes sense, even more sense now. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I did 30 COVID videos on Instagram. They're about 30 minutes each. I did one, I did one like every day, mainly because I was pissed off that I, that I felt like the, the, the general public was being bullied. They're being, they're being lied to, you know, because, um, uh, one of the big tricks of the media is they never give the denominator and they say thing like COVID cases skyrocket, uh, you know, up 300%. It's like, okay, well it went from three to 12. Like, is that a big deal? No. Right. And I'm, and I'm not saying it was that severe, but that's, that's what they do all the time, you know? Yeah. And they're doing it. They're doing it now too. They're like, you know, how high cases are. And you're like, okay, but, we're still like one tenth of the cases we were at at the peak, and we're still at half the cases we were at when you opened when you reopened the economy because everything was going so well. Yeah. So like it, they never they never give the denominator; they just spin it the way they want to. So I was just in there like giving some reality. I was like pulling up uh, worldometers and saying, "All right, here's the actual death rate. Here's the actual case rate. Here's the actual case fatality rate. This is worldwide. Here's nationwide. Here's state by state. Pulling it up and just showing like this is the data." I'm not, I'm not saying, uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying that everybody's lying to you. I'm just saying this is the actual data and the actual data is like, you know, out of all the people who are sick, these are the people who are critically sick. You know, all the people that we know have the cases, these are the people who are critically uh, ill and these are the, and this is the number of people who are dying. And that number never changed. I mean, right. it didn't, it never changed throughout the entire pandemic and it still hasn't changed to this day other than with this new Delta variant that everybody spun up about we've completely decoupled death and illness. So, you know, there's very, very, very few deaths uh, with this, you know, with, with this Delta variant relative to the, you know, the number of cases. So they keep saying, oh, the cases, cases, cases. It's like, <clears throat> you know, shutting down or, you know, doing mask mandates and stuff in, <coughs> excuse me, in DC. And they've had two deaths in the last two weeks. Yeah, it, it's getting crazy. But I want to jump back to your uh, your time with Buds. Sorry, I had a little epiglottis failure. No problem. Yeah. So, so your time at Buds. Uh, I don't want to go through every step of it. I think there's been enough people talking about Buds. But I really do want to touch on, as a young sailor, you just got out of boot camp, just got out of A school. You show up to your first day. Uh -huh. Uh, how much of a culture shock was that for you? Um, yeah, let me think about that. Uh, you know, so when I was in boot camp, um, so one of, one of the things they did was uh, with that die fair program, you didn't just get to take the test multiple times. You got to go train in the mornings. And you, go, you got to go train with the SEAL motivators. If you if you failed the test the first time, then you could go train with the SEAL motivators before your next test. If you failed that one, you, should, you could go train with them for a while again. And there was, I, I don't remember how long you had in between taking it. Maybe it's like a week or something. So they had this 4 a.m. training and it was kind of all the components. It was running and swimming and calisthenics and 
what have you and all that. And I'd done so well on the test initially that uh, the SEAL motivators asked me if I would come and be like one of the coaches <laughs> because I, you know, I'd grown up swimming and lifeguarding and <clears throat> I had the side stroke down really well. And I, and like I said, I, I was just, I was a good athlete. And so um, I, I did really well on the test and they said, well, you know, <clears throat> we, we come in the mornings and train these guys. So it worked out great for me because it was like the first three hours of, <clears throat> of uh, boot camp every day, I was at the gym working out and hanging out with the seals. And uh, so I got to know them and I got to, I got to know the culture a little bit. Cause I did that. Uh, I mean, I think I took the test like the second weekend. So it was like the next six weeks, like every single day, seven days a week, I went over to the gym for three hours a day and I worked out and I taught other guys how to do side stroke and, you know, whatever, improve their pull-ups and things like that. And then I hung out with the seal motivators and they would drink coffee and pick on me, you know, like, <laughs> you know, like they do, but they picked on me cause they like me and you know, they give me shit. Uh, I, I was so naive. I didn't know I was going to get paid to be in the military. Huh? Um, they thought that was the funniest damn thing they'd ever heard in their life. And so the, this, uh, petty officer Winkler was, he was the, the biggest personality amongst the seal motivators. And he took me around to every single office and the entire building there. And it wasn't just seals. It was like, you know, 20 different people. I mean, tell them what you just told me, you know, <laughs> because I didn't know, I didn't know I was going to get paid. Like he said something about getting die pay or hazard duty pay or something. I was like, what, what do you mean? And he, you know, and I was like, we're going to get paid. <laughs> Cause I thought, you know, they're going to give me uniforms. They're going to feed me. They're going to train me. And I'm just going to, I'm going to live in the barracks and I'm going to train and I'm going to go operate and I'm going to come back and train. And I'm like, what, what I I'm like, why would they give me money? Um, never entered my mind. I was going to get paid. So like, you know, so I got to know the community a little bit that way. Um, I also got to hang around a lot of guys who wanted to be seals, like when I was coaching with them. And then when I went to a school, we there, I was at, at great lakes is a really big command. And there were about 20 guys that wanted to go, you know, they were slated to go to buds and we all worked out together. Um, some of those guys got there before me and like we stayed in touch and we got to talk a little bit about what they were experiencing when we got there. Um, and then when I got there, you know, there were already, you know, half a dozen, maybe 10 guys there that I knew who had are like, who had been there a couple of weeks before me and they, they hadn't classed up yet, or they were already in the class. And so it wasn't a huge, it wasn't a huge culture shock. Cause I felt like, you know, I had a little bit of community when I got there. Um, and you know, and honestly, like it, it wasn't that different than Texas 5A football, you know, as far as like the intensity and, you know, kind of fear that's there knowing that, you know, the coaches are about to come rip on you and like you can't do anything but suffer and, you know, try to perform well um, and no idea how long it's going to last or, you know, what's going to happen. And you're just going to go. And so like, it, I, I think I was, I was pretty well prepared for that. Um, I was a terrible runner because I, I started buds at 225 pounds. And back in those days, like the average seal was probably 150, 160 pounds. You know, it was a super endurance oriented program and it's still enduring, but you know, they're doing like more kind of high intensity stuff as well, which I would have done really well at because I was a power athlete. You know, I, I played football my whole life, run track and field my whole life. And I, and I'd even started powerlifting my last year in high school. Um, actually competed in my last year in high school in powerlifting, um, so it, it wasn't a, it wasn't a huge culture shock to me. But of course, there was the intimidation of you know this Just. big machine that you're walking into. Uh, you know, you're walking into this command of all these guys in their green shorts and their blue and gold shirts and their caps down and their razor sunglasses and they're just, they're like demigods to you right like as far as you know they've all killed a million men with their <laughs> bare hands and they're just you know they're just yeah. waiting for their chance to rip on you and, and find your weakness you know so they're like it was it was super intimidating but as far as like the the culture i felt i felt comfortable with the group already you know like i felt like those, those were my people already and we're kind of like we're a team we're into this together because i you know because of football i think i you know the team sports just made i just feel that way i just i just felt that way about it so now when you were going through buds, um, you see people drop in all the time, ring in the bell. Yeah. Did you ever have a moment where that crossed your mind? No. Um, I, I've, I've had this conversation so many times with, with so many guys and, and, uh, you know, still to, to this day, my best friend in the world is the guy 
who's my he was my first roommate in buds like we you know we had we had three but he was the first guy who moved in with me i i was the first one in the room he came in like a couple of nights after me um and uh and we were and then one of his friends that he joined the navy with from high school he came to steel training as well um so it was the three of us we were all like 18 years old and then there was an older guy in there older meaning he was like 24 25 he had been through Bud. He had been to Bud's once, uh, and got medically dropped. Um, and we just idolized this guy. Like thought, like he was the man. You know, like he knew everything. We just looked up to him. He was like our, he, you know, he was like our our father figure. Like we we did what he told us to do, and he um, he made he made our lives better. Um, and then he he quit during Hell Week, and we were like, what? <laughs> you know, he like. Uh, uh like we did this thing called lion's lope uh and and I, and I think this works to disadvantage of a lot of guys so me like me and my best friend we were both just kind of uh really aggressive guys you know it's like we just uh, all stress got converted into anger and aggression essentially you know so like we just tried harder and like the more intimidation there was like the harder we, the harder we charged and uh and that was our personality uh, but a lot of people in there, like a lot of people knew a ton about what was going on. Right. And they talked to people and they took notes and they like, and they thought they could like game out the system and like conserve energy here. Cause they knew that was going to be really hard or, you know, or do some sort of secret preparation for this, that they knew was coming up. And we never did any of that. Like me and me and my close friends, like we just, took whatever came right because like who knows it, it, anything could change at any time and it didn't matter what was coming next all we had to do is get through what we're in right now and then we'll worry about what's coming next when we get to what's coming next um and those people i think were the most likely to quit because they i mean you think about it like if you knew how if you knew how hard the track was uh you know uh, it's one of the biggest one of the most common sayings in entrepreneurship is like uh if, if you knew how hard it was going to be to build your business to success, most people wouldn't do that. Like most people wouldn't yeah. redo it. They'd look back and go, this was exponentially harder than I thought it was going to be. So they, like, they would have pulled out. Uh, and I think it was the same way. So like, you know, there was this exercise coming up as lion's lope. And as soon as they announced it, I mean, a flood of people ran up to quit. And, and I, I couldn't get my head around that. I was, I was like, well, look, we haven't done anything yet. Like, why are you going to quit now? Like, you know, quit while you're doing it. If it's impossible, right? Like if you, if you, if you feel like you're in fear for your life and you don't want to keep going, then quit while you're doing it or, you know, but even more odd to me, it was like, well, you knew it was coming, right? Like you, you've been planning this for a long time. So if you knew it was coming, why are you going to quit before you even start? Like that doesn't, didn't make any sense to me. And I remember, uh, watching my uh my roommate you know this older guy that we all respected i remember him quitting and like we literally ran up there and tried to pull him out of line and the instructor beat the crap out of us sent us back and you know into the formation and uh and i just remember watching him and thinking like put try to put myself in his shoes for a minute and like what does what's it gonna feel like when he rings that bell and it just like made me this really nauseous like i just felt sick and i'm like nope <laughs> i better turn that off like that's as close as i ever came you know i was like I, I wasn't thinking about it myself i just thought what would it feel like that was the first time i even entered my mind what it would feel like because like you know i had something to prove and i i was not going to quit like i there were plenty of times where i thought i was going to die and i just thought all right that's that's what's gonna happen i'm gonna die i'm i'm not going to quit uh so if i die i die and um and almost everybody I know who made it through buds will tell you the same thing. Like they never, it never entered their mind. They were like, they're going to have to carry, carry me out here on a stretcher or in a body bag. I'm not, I'm not quitting. Like you, uh, you can do whatever you want. I can fail out. And I was really afraid of failing out because I could barely pass the time runs. You know, I just, I was just, I wasn't built for that. I'm, you know, um, I, I was just too big and like too much of a power athlete and like all those, you know, six and 10 miles, you know, training runs are just ridiculous for me. Uh, they were at least 30% faster than I could actually run. 
Um, and, uh, you know, I, I guarantee you, I was running at maximal heart rate the entire time you know, for like, you know, an hour and a half, two hours, I was running at like my, my cardiac threshold. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I, I don't remember your exact question. I think <laughs> oh, I no, it was just asking you, uh, whether you ever thought of a moment where you may have quit. Oh, right. yeah. So to that, um, for the guys that are going to watch us who, maybe are thinking about going that route. I have a few friends that have tried and didn't succeed. Mm -hmm. They said that the swimming was the thing that kicked their ass. No, it, it, uh, it depends really on the individual. Like everybody's going to have a weakness. Um, of course, like I said, my running was, my running was my weakness. Um, PT, I was good at, um, for the most part, uh, you know, the obstacle course, I was probably average at, uh, swimming. I was, I was really good once we got to fence, right. Cause, uh, I, I, I have really, I have really big legs and it was just super easy for me to create a lot of torque with fence. Um, but as far as like all the swimming in the pool, like that was miserable. Uh, but as far as, you know, uh, you're doing side stroke for all the tests. So that's not a super fast stroke. I mean, now you have to really be as efficient. If you learn that stroke, um, and you put out like, I, I don't know that that, you know, that many people will fail, um, for speed, but what you do, you know, you do the drum proofing and you're doing like buddy carry swims and, um, you know, and you're essentially, you feel like you're drowning in the pool, like hours a day. I mean, you're, you're just in there getting beaten up in the pool, uh, you know, doing like breath hold thing. Like I remember this one, one day, it's like one of the first tests we did, you had to swim across uh, across the pool and backs is 50 meters. You had to go, uh, underwater. And so when we all practiced this in boot camp, you know, we sat next to a wall, we got ourselves ready and, you know, we had to ventilate a little bit and then we did our kickoff and then, you know, we timed it and, you know, and it wasn't, it didn't seem like it was all that hard, but then in buds, it's like, yeah, the, you're tired already. They're running or running you around, doing a bunch of stuff. You're exercising, you're already exhausted. Then they just blow the whistle, surprise everybody, throw everybody on the side of the pool. All right, now we're going to do this. You just line up. You have to do a flip off the side of the pool and then you can't come back up. No matter how you land, you do a flip, go in the water, and then you swim there and back. And if you come up, you quit. And if you pass out, you fail. So that seemed pretty harsh to me, right? I'm like, uh, you know, because like, again, I grew up around the water. I grew up around lakes and rivers and swimming pools and the ocean. Like, and like, we just did that. Like we, me and all my friends loved the water and we were just always in the water. So I was super comfortable in the water. Uh, and I could hold my breath really a long time. So I, like, it was, it wasn't that tough for me, but there are plenty of people like that was the toughest thing for them. One, like there were probably people doing that who've never done a flip off the side of the pool before. Right. Just like stand on the edge of the pool and try to do a flip. And land in the water and then swim there there are people like you know face planning trying to do their flip and then they can't come back up they might not even be oriented to which way they're going and they have to figure out which way they're going and then go and come back like they've already wasted you know 20 seconds or something um and you know that like that was pretty harsh you know and then we do you know you do brown drown proving where you're basically in you're in the pool for about two hours tied up and you're doing all sorts of different exercises with your hands tied behind your back and your and your leg and your ankles tied together um, and a lot of people freak out. A lot of people get scared. A lot of people don't feel that comfortable with it. Um, I float because I, because I have big lungs. Some people just sink like rocks and it's, you know, so, uh, you know, everybody's going to have their Achilles heel. Like nobody's going to be good at everything. Um, but I don't think that there's anything amazingly athletic about buds. Um, you don't have to be like a world-class athlete in any one thing. You just have to be a pretty good athlete at everything. You have to be durable. Like you have to be able to, you know, take a beating and recover and like recover the next day. Like, you know, train, you know, train in physical activity 12 hours a day and come back the next day strong enough to do 12 hours that day and the next day and the next day and the next day. Um, so in that respect, uh, you know, that's, that, and it's not really cardiovascular endurance as much as it is just like physiologic durability right metabolic fitness and uh physiologic fitness and so there's definitely you know there's a genetic component to that like you know all men aren't created equal right that's why we have the olympics uh you know nobody wants to watch me run 
you know, hundred meters in the Olympics, cause it'd be boring. Right? Yeah. It's like, uh, like, uh, you know, we, we're, we're, we're all different, you know? Um, and so uh, there, there are definitely, I, I, I agree with you that I think, uh, most people, most people who fail, uh, fail over the water and not whether that's actual ability to swim or just comfort in the water. Um, you know, like pool comp when you're just getting beaten up, like you go in with all your gear on and instructors come down and you know, they're punching you and pulling your mask off and ripping your regulator out and throwing you all around. And you have to like, you know, keep calm and go through the procedures and put everything back on and untie knots and all this other stuff. And that it, it just takes somebody who's really confident in the water. And that's not something you're going to learn in a, in a couple of weeks, right? Like you right. have to show up with that. Yeah, I was... Uh, at my last command, my last Marine Corps command, uh, that was, it was a recon command here in San Antonio, uh, yeah. reserve unit. You would be surprised on how many of these guys came into the recon community and had no idea how to swim. I wouldn't be surprised because when I was working, <laughs> when I was working at that boot camp uh, training course in the morning, where I told you I was working with the SEAL motivators. Uh, <clears throat> One of the things that I helped guys a lot with was uh, the side stroke. Right? Like I was, I was kind of like, uh, I, I was the ace instructor for that because I, you know, uh, one thing I can't swim uh, freestyle very well. Like I, uh, my shoulders burn out super quick. Uh, but but I have a really good scissor kick and I knew the form really well. Like I said, I'd I'd, I'd been a lifeguard like since I was probably. 13 or something ridiculous. So like I'd, I'd, de- I'd done miles and miles and miles of side strokes. So I, I would instruct people and do the side stroke. And I remember some really, really poor swimmers. And I remember this one kid, I kept trying to teach him how to do the side stroke and he would do like one stroke, maybe two. And then he would, he would be sinking and he'd stand up again. And I'm like, all right, well, all right, let's, you know, let's put your legs up on the side and just work on your arms. Okay. Yeah, I got that. Okay, let's put, let's hold on to the side and just work on it. Like, okay, all right. And I put the boats both together. Let's go. And he'd go and he'd sink. He'd go and he'd sink. And I worked with him for at least an hour before it occurred to me to ask him, do you know how to swim? <laughs> he said, no. <laughs> and I was like, you don't know how to swim. <laughs> He's like, no. I said, why do you, why are you trying not to be a seal if you don't know how to swim? And he goes, well, I wanted to be a nuke, but my, my recruiter told me the fastest way to be a nuke was to become a seal first. <laughs> so I was like, oh man, <laughs> oh man. <clears throat> so, wow. So, uh, like, he was the most severe. Like, he literally could not swim. Like, he couldn't dog paddle. He, if he, if he threw him off in the deep end, he would drown. Um, and so he was the worst. But I saw a lot of guys who really, I mean they really could about dog about dog paddle and that was about it they could maybe dog paddle for a minute or two and then they would sink so it it was it was surprising to me then but it's not it's not and, and i've heard legions of stories like that from other yeah. seals who worked with guys like it's a really common thing like people don't know what they're getting into you know and back then too is pre-internet um and all that stuff was really kind of kept secret like you didn't nobody knew what you were going to do they just knew it was really hard like that documentary i saw on seal training like that was the first thing anybody knew about seal training like they, people didn't even really still know what a seal was um you know there's like a few books in the library you could find you know three or four paragraphs about the vietnam era seals and that was about it like nobody nobody knew what these guys were doing so uh, now it's like there's all these prep courses and there's online like you know the seals themselves have like online training programs and communities and guys like mark divine have prep courses that you can go train for a year before you even go to buds and you know i mean there there's a there's very little excuse to not be ready for it when you get there um but the truth of the matter is that there is a certain amount of fate involved you know some really good guys didn't make it yeah. Um, and it was for some just, you know, surprising, uh, unexpected things that popped up for whatever reason. Um, like literally, uh, I, I would say this, this one guy that I'm, I'm still friends with, he didn't make it through. And, uh, you know, he was, he was part of that boot camp or that a school group I was telling you about when we had about 20 guys that all worked out together. And he was like, he was the hardest, he was the hardest guy there. He was smart. He was mature. Uh, he was a good athlete. He was good at everything. 
um, and he didn't make it through. Like the top officer in my class broke his leg like the week before graduation. Uh, you know, he, he ended up making it through, but it was a compound fracture, so he was out for like six months. You know, I mean, there 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 is a lot of fate involved, and you know, and you can get hypothermia and get washed out. You can get uh, you know, you can get injured in hell week, uh, just at the wrong time to where you can't roll forward. You have to roll backwards. Then you got to start all over. And depending on how much of a beat down you can take, you might not have it in you to start all over, you know? Um, yeah. So it, it's, it's, uh, you, you can do your best to prepare, but it's like anything else in life surprises just can come up. Um, and you know, the, 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 I, I think the most tragic part about it is how how much people let that mean about themselves because um, they put so much importance on it and then when they don't make it 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 like devastates them and it it's it's shaping their life it's shaping their personality and their worldview 30 years later well I don't know if you heard um, remember the fire on the Bonhomme Richard that happened yep. la- the fire on the Bonhomme Richard that happened last year in port in San Diego yeah. It just came out that NCIS arrested a kid who was a Buds dropout. Um, he failed out of Buds. He was pissed off at the Navy and um, burnt mm-hmm. down the ship. Yeah, and now um, in what, just about what, two years ago, was it? We had that suicide. Maybe a little longer than that. Some officer that didn't make it just like... Uh, jumped off the top of the barracks or the, the officer's barracks or something suicided the first night like they sent him home didn't put him on suicide watch there's all this his family was trying to sue the navy um yeah i mean it people take it super personally and i can't say that i wouldn't have um but i look back on it now you know and, and it's easy to say if you've made it i guess you know but like I don't look down on people who didn't make it. I mean, I, I realized I could have been one of those people, like something could have happened and I, and I wouldn't have made it, you know, like you don't, you don't have a, like a 95% attrition rate because only 5% of the people are prepared. You know, it's like, there's, there's definitely at least, you know, 40% of the people who are prepared and ready to, and capable of making it. Um, but you know, fate gets involved. Yeah. Um, and you know, and you can have other stuff. I mean, what if like you can have some, personal catastrophe a personal crisis you know personal health crisis or family crisis or something that just messes with your brain a little bit and you're a little off you know you're a little out of your little off your game and you and you fail a couple of things and you know i mean it it's 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 harder to fail now um because when <clears throat> when rumsfeld uh well i don't know about now but um because I haven't really talked to people in the program for the last, for a couple of years, but you know, Rumsfeld came out and had his, you know, his number one priority for the military was to create 2000 seals or something like that. I remember that. Um, and so, you know, we only have one facility that does it. <laughs> uh, we can only put so many people through uh, and we didn't really seem, didn't really seem what we, didn't really seem to matter what we did as a community to prepare people for the failure rate and people who quit, like it's the same number, right? That's like, for whatever reason, that's just the way it works out. Um, but what they, what they started doing was like making it, um, you know, because there, there was some, you know, like most of my instructors were like Vietnam air seals, right? And they were, you know, they were the dirty dozen, right? Like those guys really had no rules and regulations. Like they, they just kind of like got them all together, trained them and said, you guys go do whatever voodoo you do, right? Like just go do it. And we, we don't want to know about it. Um, and so there is a different mindset. And and there was, there was a lot of sort of community say so as to whether or not you were right to be a SEAL. Um, so you could be a great athlete, but if they thought you were arrogant or narcissistic, disrespectful, um, you know, if you're there for self-serving reasons, like they would wash you out. Um, and they can make anybody quit. I mean, they can, or they can make anybody fail. They can just beat you down to where you can barely move and go, okay, now it's time for the time to run. So now if you fail the time run, you fail. Right. Um, and it, if you've been running for the last six hours before the time run comes, guess what? You're failing, right? <laughs> like, you, you, know, you know, unless you're just an amazing runner. Um, so like there, uh, there was some of that and probably, 
uh, you know, you could make the case that that's, that's unfair because you could just have somebody who has a hard on about you and doesn't like you and is going to wash you out. So they've gotten away from that. They've made it really hard to get rid of people. It's a lot like HR and businesses now. It's like you have to document all these failures. You have to document any behavioral problems. You have to document, document, document. They give people multiple choices or multiple chances to pass things. You know, like, like I was telling you that, that underwater swim thing we did, we lost like 30 people. (laughs) It was like the first week of training. It was just like out, 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 like, you failed that that was done it's like I, you, you hardly even got your feet wet yet like you're just starting and like oh you didn't make that see ya. there was no roll back and try again it was like oh, was, I, I think no i take it i think you get to come back like after lunch and try one more time or something um but it, it wasn't like this process now you know there's like this process now you go to a board they review your records you have scores for everything it's super documented we didn't have any records when we went through but it's like you know they didn't keep any files on anybody um, like they just record, you know, like the evolution sheet had everybody's name on it, whatever your time was or whatever, like that was on there. Uh, but they didn't like, you didn't have individual files and like people have individual files now. And, uh, you know, so I think it's more fair than it's ever been. Uh, but ironically it didn't change the attrition rate at all. <laughs> the same number of people quit the same number of people fail. So, uh, you know, and, you know, and, and you think about that and, um, you know, on one hand, it's, it, it makes you feel really good that, you know, you're one of the people who, you know, managed to make through this training. And if you say, you know, 10% of it was just bad luck, well, you still outperformed 85% of the people. Um, and that's just the people who had the balls to try. Right. So like you take, and so it just, it makes you feel good about yourself. Right. And you need confidence, uh, to do that job. You need to feel like there's something special about you because it's an insane job an insanely dangerous job so you have to believe for some reason that that it's not as dangerous for you um so i i mean i i think overall um it, it's nice that it's fair and it, um it's nice that it's more fair now um and it's somewhat ego stroking that it didn't change the attrition rate much but at the other side of the coin you look at it uh if 95 percent of the people don't make it and that means 95 cents out of every dollar the Navy spends is wasted. True. Um, and that's hard to sustain. That's really hard to sustain. I mean, there's a, you're pouring in a lot of money to get five or 10% of the people to succeed. Yeah. And then you're going to have, you know, people who don't want to be in the Navy outside of being a SEAL. Right. Exactly. Going to ships. And... Right. Right. I mean, because if I wouldn't have made it and I'd been sent to a ship, I cannot imagine the homicidal rage I would be living with every day of my life. Like I, I like, I think that would have turned out really badly. I mean, I, I probably would end up getting thrown out, I'm guessing, cause I, I would have been insanely angry about that. Yeah. And the, the only rate that I think that the Navy has at that time, that probably would have been, they wouldn't have been happy about failing out, but would have had another chance at something special would have been the corpsman. Because yeah. they would have probably been kicked over to the fleet, uh, to the Marines, and they had the right. recon pipeline that they could do. Right, right. So yeah, and and you know there there are, you know, now that I'm more mature, I look back on it, it's like it 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 would have been a great opportunity for me, even if I did fail, <laughs> would have been a great opportunity for me to go in the in in the military, you know, in the regular Navy and do, do my best and get out when my time was up, you know, but, um, you know, it's, it's kind of the last rite of passage left for men in America, right there. We don't, we don't really have a rite of a passage, a rite of passage towards adulthood for men anymore. And like the military thing is probably the closest thing we have to that, you know, I think so um, too. And, and it, and it would have been a shame if I would have wasted that just because I was so bitter about not making to making it through SEAL training. But fortunately, I, I made it, and we didn't have we didn't have to test that theory. But I, um, yeah, I mean, it, so like I'm saying, one, on one hand, I get it that it would be I'd be embittered for not making it, um, and it probably would have had some a pretty big impact on my life. But at the same token, I, 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 I know that I don't look down, and I don't know anybody. <laughs> Uh, any of the seals that I know, and of course I know a lot of seals, yeah. uh, having been a seal for a long time and then, or for a while, and then been a doctor for the seals for a while, and then 
I still work with SEALs and retiring SEALs and all that stuff now as a, as a position. And so uh, I know a lot of SEALs and I don't know any guys who look down on people who didn't make it, you know? Yeah. I think almost it, almost every one of them have the humility to say, yeah, it could have been me. Like that could have happened to me. Definitely. Um, so speaking of um, reinforcing, when you graduated, did you know that there was the next step of going through all your PQSs. I don't know if back then they did them in house or if you had SQT at the time. Yeah. So, um, so about two weeks before we graduated, um, they took us on the tour. They took us on tours of the West coast SEAL teams. So back in, back in these days in late eighties, early nineties, uh, the teams were still divided up into operational areas. So team five was like Southeast Asia. Uh, team one was like, uh, west uh, north northwestern european germany kind of stuff um team three uh, team three might have been africom or something I, I can't remember exactly what everybody's there but we all had our operational area and i remember uh about two weeks before we graduated you know you had to do the dream sheet and you had to say what what teams you wanted to go to and of course we couldn't visit the east coast seal teams um so we just went through the West Coast SEAL teams and then you, and then you, you know, you could go to one, three, five, seven, or you could do, you could go to one, two, three, five. Six, yeah. Yeah. No, seven wasn't there yet. Obviously you couldn't go to six. Um, yeah. So you, you could choose two, two East Coast SEAL teams or two West Coast SEAL teams essentially, or three West Coast SEAL teams. And then there was SDVs. Um, and so they took us around on a tour and kind of showed us and a few people talked to us about what we did. And like, I realized at that time, like that was kind of my wake up that, oh, I, I didn't really think about the next step. Like I didn't really think about what was going to happen after bus. I was like, huh, like, I don't, I don't really know. Like, so I, you didn't know you were getting paid and yeah. you didn't know what was going to happen after buds. Yeah. And I was, I was like, well, yeah, I guess like, uh, I don't really like the cold much, you know, grew up in Texas. So I'll try to stay on the West coast. Like that was my logic. Um, uh, not really knowing much about, uh, either coast. And, uh, and then we, and I did know we had to go to jump school afterwards. Um, and the, they, it, at one point they took uh, graduating buds classes and they just sent the whole class to army jump school. And then when you come back from jump school, you go to whatever seal team you're slotted for. Um, and then the seals just cost, or we weren't seals in those days. So now when you graduate bud, you're a seal. When I graduated bud, you weren't even close to being a seal yet. You're just a buds graduate. Um, and so we went to, we went to, um, you know, they, they would send out piecemeal guys to jump school, but, um, they'd started this, uh, you know, this medical rollback thing for people who were injured. And so we, we, in second phase, we gained 20 people. And in third phase, we gained 20 people. So we ended up with this graduating class of like 64 people, you know, it's like 24 originals, but then like we, we pulled in like 20 from the next two phases. And so there's like, this is too big, like, you know, so they're just going to send it, they sent us all the army jump school all at once. And that was, uh, <laughs> it was a shit show. I, mean, I bet the army appreciated that a lot oh God, we caused so much trouble we were so arrogant because you know we're going there and you know that's an elite school for them it's important to them and they're like they have a lot of pride going through it and to us it's just like you know getting our passport stamped or something like all right we got to get this thing you know he's like it's dumb like no, there's nothing that was hard or challenging or scary for us there and we're so we're just like going along with like army training schedules it's totally different right i mean it's like hundred like thousands of people they're training all at once whereas like you know we're training 20 guys with you know 10 instructors like you know you're you're just getting super high paced stuff um uh so we did we did jump school and then we went back and then we went to our seal teams and then it was when i got to the seal teams that i learned that i was going to do what they called then stt they call it sqt now uh we call it seal tactical training um and each team had their own and now they have you know, I think the entire, like the entire budget class goes through it at, at once at, uh, on the West coast. And then they go to their teams after that. And so that was when I went through training, that was, uh, so you did jump school, which was, I can't 
can't remember. Do you know? Like six weeks, maybe eight weeks. Jump school. Like I think it's yeah. like twenty-one days. It's quick. Yeah, it's yeah. It wasn't super long. Yeah. Uh, ours was long because we had a couple of people die in there, and so we kept getting stand downs for like three or four days. Um, but then we went back to the SEAL teams. We did this STT thing, and that was six months. Um, and during that six months, you actually learned how to be a SEAL because, of course, you didn't learn how to be a SEAL and Bud. You just learned how to do some basic skills, and it was really just kind of a beat down. Uh, you know, they they were evaluating you as a person right? and as a and as a candidate. But then you you know you go to the SEAL teams. You actually learn some tactics, and you learn you know how to use radios appropriately and how to you know do your gear appropriately, how to patrol appropriately. You know, like yeah, the, about vehicles and boats and like you. you higher level training um and then that was just enough to make you a new guy in a platoon and then you got in the platoon as a new guy and everybody senior to you was evaluating you and they and they you know they all had the right to go and and say that they didn't think you were a right fit um and so that was uh that was um i think another six months uh uh, you were on a probation period. Um, yeah. So, so I think after, after STT, there was a, there was a written and an oral board. Oh, okay. Uh, and then, and it was like all the master chiefs in the command <clears throat> and some of the officers, if they're usually, if they're Mustang officers and they, <clears throat> they could just, I mean, you stood up in front of them for an hour and a half in front of a chalkboard and they could ask you anything about anything, you know, like radio frequencies for this kind of aircraft versus that kind of like, you know, field strip this weapon, name that part, name this part, name that part, tell me the chamber you know, chamber pressure, what's the nozzle velocity, what's the effective range, blah, blah, blah. Uh, anything about the diving equipment, any, like any little nuance, be like, what is that screw right there called? And, you know, what do you torque it to? And how do you, um, and, you know, part of that is, to see if you know anything, but part of it's also to see how you deal with an impossible situation because you're not going to know everything that all these guys are asking you, right? Like they've been doing this for 30 years. They know stuff you don't know. Um, and then if you pass that, then you had a six month uh, probation in your, in your platoon, which is you were actually going out and operating, right? You're going out and doing training. You're traveling with your platoon. You're, you're operating as though you were a member of the platoon. Um, and so it was you know, th the best evaluation of what you were going to be like once you actually became a SEAL. And then at the end of that probation period, you got your trident. So, you know, it was over a year after you graduated BUDS before you became a SEAL. Um, and then BUDS is six months. And if you get there, like I got there the day that the class before me was classing up. Um, so I couldn't class up with that class because I just, I mean, I wasn't ready. I didn't have any, I didn't have anything hadn't done any of the preparation work to be in the class so like we had a pre-training which was just basically beat down, beat down. <laughs> so you get two extra months of beat down so i was at budge for eight months then went to jump school forever whatever month or whatever that was and then a year uh, six months of stt and then a, um and then six months of probation and then you became a seal and i i mean i became a seal like i mean a week or two before my first deployment you know Damn. So it, it, it took a while and I think it was better that way. Um, and, and obviously the reason they had to switch it though is, um, is, is because they made seals a rate. Um, because you know, when I was in you, my rate was gunner made. So when I went for advancement, I, I tested against the fleet and I had to test on Mark 26 missile launching systems and stuff. Right. And I'm like, uh, like the, hy know. the hydraulics, the hydraulics of a, uh, of a phalanx or something. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> you know, I kind of remember I did something like that in gun school. Uh, you know, so, um, yeah, they, they decided that it would make it better to make seals a rate. And when you do that, well, then when you finish your a school, which is now buds, you have to come out with that rate, which is a now seal, but I've heard a couple of years ago that they've switched it back and like people are going through getting rates now oh really that'll be yeah. interesting because um well let me jump to this real quick and then we'll come back to that so this is what early 90s when you finally uh get out of buds yeah i graduated uh i just i was just, i was going i'm 
I'm a, I was applying for another medical license the other day and I was going through a bunch of Navy paperwork and I found my, like I'm terrible at organizing stuff, but I, I don't throw stuff away. So like I had, I have like every certificate from <laughs> going back like to 1987. I have my enlistment papers in the oh, folder. Yeah. Right? Um, and then I had, uh, so yeah, I, I checked into, uh, I checked into SEAL Team 5 in January of 1990. So so uh, it was still it was still a year from that before I was technically a SEAL. So that's where I was going to go next. Was 1990? We kind of got into a little scuffle with Iraq. Did they call you guys up for that? Yeah. So um, a typical platoon workup was anywhere from 12 to 18 months, um, depending on what type of a platoon it was, uh, and so. I got in, I was fortunate in that I, I got into uh, what was called back then a free fall platoon. Um, you know, we didn't have, I mean, SEALs didn't have anywhere close to the money that they have now when I went through SEAL training, right? Like we were, we were still ragtag. We we're still literally, we we're using Vietnam era web gear when I was a SEAL. Um, and so, <clears throat> um, we, uh, We lost my train of thought. Uh, no, I was just asking, uh, did you guys, did you end up going to Iraq the first time? Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, so my platoon workup was, uh, it was supposed to be a year. You know, it's supposed to be a year and a half. And then it got shortened to like eight months because we were going to go to the Iraq war. And so we crammed all of our training in, you know, because there's certain things you need to be confident on, but they, they obviously specifically focused it towards that. Um, and then about maybe two weeks before we were set to deploy, they shifted us, sent an ARG platoon over there and then put us over in the Philippines. And so I didn't end up going to that. Um, and then we went out, we went out to the Philippines, um, which was our, Kind of standard deployment area and then from there we got new fit we got and train other military forces and do training you know do special forces and other militaries in southeast asia and all that and just do training trips and that and the like um and uh then i got to be there from mount pinatubo <laughs> when, when mount pinatubo exploded and destroyed the philippines essentially and came in with a couple of typhoons and um so yeah so we had I don't know, like something like 300 earthquakes and we had all this ash coming down. We, so, uh, Clark air base had, had boulders that were 30 feet in diameter that were landing five miles from the van, five miles from the volcano, like on top of cars and parking lots and stuff. I mean, oh, they, wow. This was a serious destruction zone. We were farther out. We didn't have that. We had like smaller debris, but a ton of ash. There's a lot of metal uh, metal and minerals in the ash and then it it probably because of the volcano you know, caused a typhoon and so then you had all this super high winds and all this rain and so that was coming down it kind of looked like snow coming down but it's super heavy and super dense um and so all the buildings were collapsing and all the you know floating docks were sinking and our pv boats were sinking and our like our command was collapsing and the on-base housing was collapsing barracks were collapsing and so of course we're the seals. So they send us out in our freaking six buys with, uh, boat, boat oars. We didn't have, pack, we didn't have shuffles <laughs> and we're like, just like in buzz, you know, we're, we're digging off of roofs and, you know, uh, there's, there's one time where we're, we're literally on a roof of like a, a, like a steel framed building, one of those corrugated, uh, steel buildings. And, um, and it, it just seemed shifty and, sketchy and like uh, all right like everybody like start getting down and we all started going up to the ladder to get down and no one had even got to the ladder yet the whole thing started collapsing we're like jumping off the building and landing in kind of like an ash pile like almost like a snowbank uh, but a lot harder um and the, and it wiped out all the electricity and it and the and the ash was so uh dense with minerals and uh and uh metals that it was completely dark i mean it was like pitch black 24 hours a day um and we and we you could 
we were wearing uh, flight suits and scuba masks and balaclavas. And you could shine a flashlight and you could see your feet. And so you just watch your feet. And there was one uh, radio tower that still had electricity. And they used three red lights on it. And you could walk towards that radio tower until you hit the water. And then you could follow the water around to the base. And then you could follow the water back around to that radio tower. And you could take a straight line and hit you back to the barracks. Um, but, you know, we were doing that on the roofs, you know, like we're climbing up on roofs and we're walking around just looking at our feet, you know. Uh, and uh, I, I remember being on top of the Paraloft, which is like 60 feet tall. And we were trying to save that. And uh, I'd, I'd come up late. I don't remember what I was doing, but I came up late and uh, I was asking guys where they're at. And they're like, come here, come here and walk towards our first one. And so I'm walking towards their voice and I can't see anything. Um, I was carrying some, some stuff and uh, I start walking and I just get like this uneasy feeling I'm like trying to picture what this building looks like. And I'm like, it doesn't seem right. So I stop. And I pull out my flashlight and I turn it on and I shine it down and no hyperbole. My toes are hanging over the edge oh, God. of this building. One more step, I would have fallen 60 feet. Oh, damn. <laughs> totally a side story, but like it just reminded no, me of it. No, that's <laughs> great. So yeah. between Iraq and 9-11, um, did you do any deployments? Did you guys hit Kosovo or anything like that that oh, you? Um, we, we we had guys um you know we we had guys like it kind of all of all of those uh, conflicts you know we had guys out there uh, a good buddy of mine who has a, a pretty good public um uh personality now he he's he's with he works with jocko and all this um the guy named jason gardner and he i know like uh, he got some, you know, like he, he was getting some sniper activity, you know, uh, he, he was a sniper, he was getting some sniper activity in like 1992 or something. Um, I can't remember, I think it was maybe Mogadishu, like I, I can't remember where he was at, but, um, you know, like, but, you know, anywhere there's those conflicts around, like we, they sent us piecemeal here and there you know but it wasn't a coordinated effort like it is now so it was kind of hit or miss whatever you ended up in you know like sometimes it would be uh you know they'd call up on a pl they'd call up on a platoon and you know the the like you know like the gulf war thing they call up on the platoon and the the you know the community would decide okay well this is going to be the platoon we're going to send out there and then uh, logistics change for a bit and things get put off. And then all of a sudden the ARG is like right offshore. And it's like, well, why are we going to pack all these guys up and fly them over there? When we have a, we have a platoon on this ARG, we can just you know, bring them to shore and, and take that, you know, so it's kind of, it, it wasn't, it wasn't super coordinated. So it was kind of hit or miss what, what you ended up doing. Uh, some guys, some guys got to do some considerable action. Some guys like me were just like Hollywood seals, man. It's like, we, we did a lot of training, a lot of training. Yeah, you know, we, we do like a little bit of police action here and there. Um, you know, like uh, I remember in the uh, in the Philippines, we went to Manila for a while. We were trying to uh, we're trying to capture some of the Sparrow teams. I don't know if you're familiar with them, guys, no. those guys. But they were they're like these little uh, you know the Filipinos have their little communist army, their little ragtag guerrilla group, uh, and they were just uh, I don't remember what started it or maybe just a whim they decided to start doing it but um they were walking through the uh walking through the, like rush hour traffic with um uh where the, where they're close to the military bases so then when the people lived off base and they'd be driving out uh and they'd be stop and go traffic and these spare team guys would just be like walking in between the cars and they just like walk right up to the guy's window and just shoot him and just keep walking oh, um okay. there and they they'd assassinated a lot i want to say they assassinated like a dozen military members uh in a really short period of time um and, you know we didn't end up catching any of them but you know and, and then we we do like you know drug interdiction ops with the fbi fbi and stuff like that like you know we we did some stuff that's like quasi fun but it was is really just like a lot of training for me so 
when people think of seals and they think of all these burly dudes with beers and shit all over them in Afghanistan, and they're like, yeah, like I'm, I'm not that guy, you know, like I didn't, I didn't, I didn't get to do any of that cool, cool guy stuff like that. So, um, I, I don't, I don't put myself in the same boat as the post nine 11 seals. They have a totally different experience with the seal teams than I did, but, um, but obviously I, I was in the community there and I, I, I was their doctor. So, you know, I, I know a lot about their trials and tribulations because I was, you know, I was helping, I was helping them recover from all of it. Well, um, let's, yeah. let's jump over to that. So at some point in time, be, and if I remember from your biography, you graduated med school in 2004. Hmm. So when did you make, what was your inspiration to go to med school? I really got shamed into it. Um, so when I was, um, when I was enlisted in the SEAL teams, like I said, we did about a year workup, six month deployment, come back, maybe have a month off and then you do another year workup and another six month deployment. And, you know, you just keep doing that over and over again. Um, and when we were deploying overseas, we were just doing a lot of fit and a lot of training. Um, and so it wasn't a super high paced thing. There was a lot of you know, you didn't have a social life because there was nowhere to go, nothing to do, you know, you, uh, you're just on a base. Um, and uh, so we did, you know, we did a lot of reading uh, pre-internet, uh, pre-video games and all that stuff. So I was dating a girl who had become my first wife. Um, I was dating a girl who was uh, getting her, her master's degree in physical therapy. So I was taking her textbooks overseas with me uh and i was reading them because i thought it'd make me a better athlete right so uh, i'd always you know i'd always been into nutrition and you know strength and conditioning and stuff my whole life uh and um so i was reading her books on kinesiology and anatomy physiology you know exercise physiology and things like that and you know i was probably understanding half of it but i was i was reading them because i thought maybe there's something in there a little pearl make me better a little, a little stronger a little faster a little more enduring whatever um and so when i decided to get out and go to college i thought you know i would do something along those lines like about maybe you know, an athletic trainer, or maybe a strength and conditioning coach, maybe even a physical therapist. But that even seemed a little lofty to me, you know, like a master's degree since I was a high school dropout. And then I started going to junior college. I had to go to junior college because obviously I didn't have a high school diploma. So I wasn't eligible to get in any four year college. And so I started out in junior college. And um, in order to apply to physical therapy school, you need 2000 volunteer hours which is, you know, a year of full-time work. So volunteering, that was going to take, you know, two or three years to get there. Right. Um, so I started, I went over to San Diego sports medicine center and I started volunteering there and, um, they hired me into a job, which would count for the volunteer hours as well. They hired me into the job of a, a physical therapist aid, it was called, um, you know, like doing ultrasounds and hooking up e stem and getting ice bags and things like that. Um, and they hired me after about a week being there. And so I worked there the whole time I was in, I was in uh, junior college and college. And, um, you know, I, I just got on really well with the head physical therapist there and, and she taught me a lot. And I was really kind of doing the same job she was doing by the time I'd been there for a year and a half or something. Like I, I kind of had my own patient load. I was doing all the same things physical therapists would do. And I was like, Mm, this isn't quite it for me, you know? Um, and, but it was this healthcare Mecca. I mean, San Diego sports medicine center had everything. And we had MDs and DOs and orthopedic surgeons and family practice and sports med guys and podiatrists and acupuncturists, massage therapists, athletic trainers, PTs, ATCs, like, you know, everything we had it all. And so I, you know, I worked with all of them and I could chat at all of them. I could talk to all of them. I got to know all of them. And, um, you know, because I had, I'd spent, you know, almost seven years in the military before I went to, uh, before I got out. And then I'd spent a couple of years in junior college. Like, you know, the doctors there were, <laughs> were new doctors. They weren't that much older than me. You know, they were like, they were like four years older than me, five years older than me. And so I got to be pretty good friends with those guys. And uh, one day they were, 
I, I was talking about all this and they were like, well, you should go be a doctor, right? And I was like, come on, <laughs> pump the brakes there, Sparky. Like, I, you know, I'm not, I, I'm, a, I'm a high school dropout. I'm not gonna get into medical school. And so we're having this debate and then the, the doctor that owned it, Dr. Lee Rice is his name, he walks out, he hear, overhears this conversation in the hallway and he walks out and he says, Kirk. And I hardly knew the guy, like, you know, he was, again, he was a demigod to me. Like I, I, uh, I was surprised he knew my name. <laughs> he goes, he's like, Kirk, the question isn't if you could get in. The question is, would you go if you got it? I said, of course I'd go if I got it. Like, well, then you have to try to get in, don't you? I'm like, I guess so. So that that conversation is literally what convinced me to try to become a doctor. Um, and then, you know, I was done with the military. I didn't have any, that was a closed chapter. I'd done my duty. I, you know, I'd, I'd done what I planned on doing. Um, but I was already married. Um, and by the time I was applying to medical school, I already had a kid. And uh, so... You know, when I went, you know, the pre-internet, you go down to the bookstore and you get the Kaplan review book and you look and see what schools you're competitive for. And so, you know, GPA, MCAT scores, like all this, and like, what do these schools select for? And as I'm flipping through this book, I find out that the military has their own medical school. And I had no idea. And I was like, really? Uh, so let me look into that a little bit. So then I found out that my, my prior time would count towards my pay and I would uh, I'd go through as a, you know, as an O1E, like an enlist, you know, with an enlisted designation, so that would that count for extra pay. Uh, and found out that it was going to be enough, like they would pay me enough money to support my family while I went to medical school, where my wife wouldn't have to work. So that's pretty hard to pass up. So um, you know the way the military works, you know they train you, and you've got to give them time in return, and so about a two to one. So you go to medical school, they train you in four years of medical school, and then you got to give them eight years as a doctor, essentially. Um, and so I figured I would get back to the SEAL teams, you know, during those eight years, and I would get to go give back to the community that was so formidable and, you know, shaping who I became as an adult. Um, it all seemed like a win win. And of course, that's what happened. So it, it all turned out great. So I know a lot of people think uh, Yushas, which is the uh Uniform, what, I forgot the exact acronym, but it's the Military Medical School. Yeah. Um, Uniform Services University of the Health Sciences just flows right off the tongue. Oh, yeah. The perfect, yeah. perfect branding. Yeah. Um, that military medicine, there's a stigma that military medicine, uh, the training, the education isn't as good as somewhere else. Is there any curriculum difference between UCIS and, say, UTSA or blah, 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 health science. No, that, um, I think, I think what probably is true is that, um, the people who stay around the military as physicians, um, long after they've paid back their obligation. Of course, there are some people who are doing it out of pure patriotism, um, and true, a true love for military life. A lot of them are doing it as a form of comfort, you know, because you are essentially a government employee at that time. Um, you a lot of the, uh, a lot of the litigious nature of medicine isn't really on, isn't really on your shoulders anymore, you know, because it's it's uh, it's all taken care of by the military. All your malpractice, everything is handled by the military. Um, any any legal battles would all be handled by the military for you, um, and you know, and it's, it's a comfortable lifestyle, you know, uh, for, for doctors. And so uh, you, I mean, it, there's not a whole lot of ambition in the guys who stayed around for a long time, but when you look at the actual early years and the training, I would say it's probably better than most schools. It's probably better than most programs. Um, because it's not, uh, it's not, you know, there's uses like, like I went to, but that's only a hundred and it's only 165, uh, doctors a year that's producing and only 50 of those are Navy doctors. Um, 
So that's not even close to the number of doctors you need to keep feeding the pipeline. The, the vast majority of people you're going to run into in training in, in these programs are on, uh, on, on uh, health professional scholarship, which is called an HPS scholarship um, or HPS program. Um, and, and I mean, I, I was, you know, I was doing my medical school rotations and my internship and residency rotations. I was doing those with people from Harvard and Yale and Cornell and Johns Hopkins and Brown and like all that stuff. Uh, all the all the UC schools, UT schools, like you know, um, and then a lot of the a lot of the senior residents and a lot of the junior staff were, you know, Ivy League highest trained guys around too, uh, and you know, you, as a doctor in the Navy, you don't make a, you don't make as much money as you would make on the outside, but as a resident uh, and as a as in training years. Uh, in your postgraduate years, you're actually making about twice, or maybe three times what you would be making on the outside. So it takes away a lot of that financial struggle. And I think that it, it leads to like more focused, more focused students and more focused training. So I, I think the training, uh, no, you don't have the variety in some senses, right? Um, you know, depending on the, what branch of the service you're in and the hospitals you're rotating through, but you know, by the time I was in, you know, third year rotations, we were already two years into the war, right? Post 9-11. Um, so we, you know, we had, we had a lot, you know, we had a lot of trauma. We had, if you're into orthopedics or trauma surgery or even general surgery, I mean, like, because people are getting uh, plastics, you know, reconstructive, all that stuff. So there, there, you know, there's a lot of training and of course it, you know that that kept going for a long time um and then you know some of these uh, uh you know surgeons and trauma trauma docs and all that stuff they get forward deployed out to these combat areas you know and they're having to make miracles happen with limited equipment limited time you know complete overwhelm and all that stuff so i in certain fields it it's probably the best training in the world you can get and then other fields it might be inadequate you know like probably the probably not the best pediatrics programs around and, and i don't know that to be true but i'm just throwing out some idea there right that it wouldn't right. be wouldn't be as as much of your of your population um you know but i i think i think the training was really good and, and i think that that shows up with um you know because when you take a you know when you become a physician the medical school curriculum is um that's a federal accreditation. So every every medical student goes through the same coursework. Um, and that's, that's the only way to be an accredited medical school is to go through exactly the coursework, the exact number of hours, the exact same material that everybody else goes through. And then you know, the training rotations are the same thing. That's all governed by federal agencies. And then when you take the licensing exam, you take the United States medical licensing exam, which is you're competing against everybody in the country. Um, and the military people compete very well. I mean, those military programs, um, are, they're well above average in, in where they kind of uh, fall out in national testing. Uh, now, obviously, you're going to have your, uh, you know, your extreme, you know, <laughs> extreme galactically smart uh, geniuses that uh, are almost certainly going to be going, you know, if they're going to be from Ivy League schools or whatever. So like that part of the bell curve that's way out there in the tail, probably there's not a lot of those people in the military because those people have been, you know, academically elite their entire lives and they, they never had any, any need for the military because they were being coveted by all of the elite programs anyway. But when you look in, you know, that normal distribution of the 86.5 you know, within that two standard deviations, you know, the military programs are, are definitely uh, skewed towards the upper end of that. Right on. So I wanted to ask you, because you mentioned it. So you get to medical school in roughly 2000 and 9-11 yep. happens. You're back in uniform. Uh, I had a friend who was a SARC, a special amphibious reconnaissance corpsman, go doctor, deployed to Afghanistan. This was a, 2010 ish and all he wanted to do was turn in his commission and mm -hmm. get back on the gun. Um, how did nine 11 affect you? 
exact same way. <laughs> exact same way. I tried, I tried to quit that day. Uh, I remember I was down in the anatomy lab in this little side classroom. I was, I was studying. Uh, my wife called me on my cell phone and said, you know, a plane just flew into one of the towers in New York. And I was like, what kind of a plane? You know, I was thinking she's talking about a Cessna or something. And I was like, you know, some moron. She's like, no, like a big plane, like a, and I was like, really? Like, you know, I still didn't quite believe it. So I went out into the, to the anatomy bay where it's like probably i mean it's long <laughs> i mean it's, it's probably 60 meters long maybe it's like this really long sort of narrow room and all the cadavers are in these stainless steel kind of coffin looking things and all this everything stainless steel the tap tables are stainless steel the stools are all stainless steel and there is a television there and i went and turned on the television and I saw the one tower, you know, burning. Uh, and then just a few seconds after I turned it on, I saw the second plane fly in. And I remember just feeling really shocked at that pit and, you know, listening to the news and I called my wife back and we were talking about it. And then when, when the first tower collapsed, <clears throat> I remember grabbing one of these stools and throwing it like the entire length of this room and going upstairs, going into the commodore's office. And I'm like, I quit. I went out. I want, I want to go back to the SEAL teams. Like I was pissed. I wanted to go murder everybody who I could to calm myself down, you know, whatever I could do. Um, but my school was a congressional appointment. So if I quit, uh, I would go do whatever, you know, whatever the military medical community wanted me to go do, but it wasn't going to be, I wasn't going to be able to go back to the SEAL teams. Um, and it would have taken me probably six months, nine months to quit. Um, and, uh, you know, basically just said, you, you can't do that. And then I, you know, kept saying I was still going to do that. I was going to figure out a way. And I was calling all these people. I was calling people back to the SEAL team. I, I didn't know any admirals, but I knew some really high ranking captains and I was calling people and, um, yeah, whatever. I just got shut down and I, I cooled off after a while. And, um, I thought, well, you know, maybe I can go out and deploy with the teams and be, a, you know, be a doctor with those guys and whatever, do some, do, do you know, provide some benefit that way. So graduating, um, did they send you directly to the teams or did you go to one of the hospitals first? Yeah. So, um, the way the military's medical program works, uh, so if you go to the civilian sector, you go <clears throat> it, during medical school, you match for the residency you want you, you pick, and rank a bunch of residencies you interview and rotate and all that stuff and then the medicals and then the programs that you pick they rank you and then they try to match it up to like you know everybody's getting the closest to their top picks um and the navy or the military does something similar to that we have a match it's not exactly the same but it's pretty close to the same ideal um and then you go do your residency but in the in the civilian sector, you just go do that residency. So like if you match for orthopedic surgery, so, so you, you go there and you do, you know, your PGY one year is like, that's technically first year of residency. It's called, most people call that an internship. And then, um, you know, depending on what you're doing, you know, there's two, three, maybe four years additional to that, depending on whatever specialty you're, you're working towards. And, uh, but the way the Navy works is they have all these ships and all these bases all over the place and they need general practitioners there. They need doctors just to do sick call and physicals and blase medical stuff. And they're not going to send an ophthalmologist out there or an orthopedic surgeon out there or like even a general surgeon because they, they're wasting, you know, specialty, uh, you know, specially trained people and taking it out of their hospital staffs. So what they do in the, in the military is they go, well, you do your first year of training and then you go out into the fleet and you have to do what's called a utilization tour, which is basically just being a general practitioner. You have to go be a general practitioner for a couple of years. 
and then you come back and you finish your residency. Um, but you can come back and do a different residency if you've changed your mind over over that time. So you've only did, you've done your first year, and you can come back and do whatever you want to. Um, <clears throat> and so when you when you do that, if you're in the Navy and you just say, "Okay, send me wherever," you're going to go to a ship, right? <laughs> And, you, and you're going to spend a couple of years on the ship being a doctor. Um, you can control your fate a little bit by going to flight school. And it was just like, it was like a Navy residency to become a flight surgeon. And you go to flight school and you learn some specialized medicine around, you know, hyperbarics and flight. And then you go out to air wings and you're positioned for air wings. Or you can go to uh, undersea medical school, undersea medical officer school, dive medical officer school. Um, and that's hyperbarics uh, and submarine and diving medicine. And then you can go out and be a physician for a diving community. Um, so of course you, the SEALs have diving community um, uh, so UM, UMOs essentially, undersea medical officers, those are the doctors that go to SEAL teams. But you know, it takes uh whatever six to eight months to go through that and then there's you know, like there could be some dead time because not everybody goes at once and so that can be like a year after you finish your residency then you go th you finish that training and then the billets instead of being two years or three years um so it eats up four years essentially to go do one of these tours instead of just letting them put you on whatever ship they want to put you on for two years but of course, I wanted to go back to the SEAL team, so I went to the UMO school. I was I was uh, I was the highest ranking guy there. I had, I had the most time, um, so I was a class officer, and you know, did well in the training and all this. And I, I should have gotten the pick of any school of any command that I wanted, uh, but you know, the way detailing works, and the detailers are like, well, you know, the SEAL community. Uh, can get by without you like we, we really need you to do this other job which is like kind of this higher profile admin, administrative job and um, so I went to something called deep submergence unit which is the submarine rescue unit so I went to there right out of uh, undersea medical school uh, and I did that job and then went from there back to the SEAL teams and then after that after my uh I really spent almost four years at the SEAL team, so I extended my billet a year, um, and then I just and then I got out of the Navy from there, and I never ended up going back into training because I got I'd gotten into what I do now. So, um, I, so how did sleep and becoming a sleep specialist <coughs> manifest itself? Yeah, so um, I, everything that I had ever done, like my only exposure to medicine. Um, you know, before medical school, my only exposure to medicine was uh, sports medicine, orthopedics, right? Because like that, that's, that's the only time I ever saw doctors when I got injured. Um, and so the, you know, as far as I knew, that was kind of the only thing they did at the SEAL teams, you know, like that was kind of the only medicine there was, was uh, rehabbing injuries um, and post-surgical rehab or orthopedic injuries, right? Um, and so, I, uh, you know, I, I, you know, my plan was to become an orthopedic surgeon. Um, then I went out to do my utilization tour. Like I said, I went to the, uh, the submarine rescue unit. I mean, that was, I mean, it really was just like, um, it, it was a policy job. Like I, you know, cause the, this is a really weird thing, but, uh, basically every country in the world that has, um, that has submarines. They all, they're all part of, they're all part of this coalition where we've all we've all agreed to rescue each other's submarines um, because you know even if you have the equipment to rescue a submarine if you're on the other side of the world from it by the time you fly all your equipment out there get it on a ship set it all up and get over there like you wasted a week whereas whoever's shore they're off of could get there immediately and, and rescue them so so the medical community I mean with everybody with russia and china <laughs> like like uh, like every, every country you can imagine that has submarines we all get together uh and we meet all the time and we talk about okay if this happens 
this, you know, this country would be in charge medical. These would, you know, these would be the chambers that we would use. This is the, you know, these are the dive tables we would use. This is how we would, you know, this is how we'd process people. This is where people would go. And it's just like constant reiteration, re, uh, rewriting of policy. Um, and you're just traveling all over the world, going from place to place to place doing this. And then the people who operate the equipment, they're working with their people who operate their equipment and they're coming up with agreed upon SOPs and all that other stuff. And then you get together every couple of years and you do big training exercises and you artificially sink some submarines and everybody tries to rescue people. And then we treat medical injuries and all that stuff. So, you know, it was an interesting job, but it wasn't even in the neighborhood of where, of where my interests lay. So um, I wanted to go to the, back to the SEAL community and I was still going to finish residency, but I was like, I, I want, I want to go, I want to go spend some, spend some time with the SEALs. So I went, I went to the SEAL teams after that. And um, I got there when they just funded the sports, uh, what were they calling the tactical athlete program at the time, but it was basically a sports medicine program. And uh, we had the funding to build our very first uh, sports medicine facility. And, you know, this surprised a lot of people because this was 2009. And um, we didn't have any of that stuff. You know, everybody would think that SEALs get treated like professional athletes or, or at least college athletes or something, but nope. Like we just, you know, we had a we had a trailer with an athletic trainer out there who did some stuff, but mainly they, they'd have to drive, you know, drive across the bridge and go to the hospital to get any kind of treatment. Um, and we didn't have like really anything in house. And so we built this, you know, of course I'd worked in, I'd worked at the San Diego sports medicine center for six years while I was. Uh, while well, I was in college. And then the one year I took off in between college and medical school. Um, and uh, so I, like I was a perfect fit for it. So they put me in charge in building out this facility um, and, you know, supervising and obviously I wasn't physically building it myself. Um, and then, uh, you know, and then we formed a group of people and we hired, uh, we hired a very first strength and conditioning coach we hired our very first physical therapist and we hired our very first nutritionist and we hired our very first athletic trainer and um, exercise physiologist and all this stuff and then you know we built this great uh, clinic there was a rehab clinic then we had a little off a little hallway in between and then we had a rehab gym on the other side that was for people who were uh, more advanced than rehab but not quite ready to be back in uh, and platoon level training. So they're training over on this other side. It's a, a little bit of accommodative gym. Um, and then, you know, we had ortho rounds coming through and we had pain rounds coming through we had acupuncture and chiropractory and all this stuff. And then we had all these brilliant people Like we hired great people. We hired people from, you know, the Olympic training center and from professional sports teams and, um, you know, high level college programs, division one college programs and all this other stuff. So we had great, great help. Um, and so then I was like the most useless person around because everybody that I hired knew orders of magnitude more than I did about whatever they did. And you know, the way the military works when you're the dumbest guy around, but you're in charge. Right. So then I'm like, you know, now you supervise this facility. I'm like, okay. So now I'm supervising a facility. <laughs> like what, do I, what the hell do I know about supervising anything? Like I've, been an enlisted seal and a doctor like okay yeah let me supervise a bunch of experts who know more than i'll ever know about their field um and uh, but my office was in that hallway in between those two in between the gym and the rehab <clears throat> and um you know i'd been a seal uh, i mean you probably know that like um kind of any special forces uh or you know anything even kind of quasi special uh force in the military anything kind of outside of just uh, grunt um the, the worst thing you can do for them is to take them out of their job right oh yeah put them on the, put them on the bench like they'd they'd rather you you know take three ranks away from them take their money take their truck uh you know keep them away from their family for a year, like anything over taking them off their, out of their platoon, put them on the bench. Like that's the worst thing you can oh. do to them. And of course, medical providers can do that. So they don't trust medical providers and they just lie. And so when they have to go do their physicals, it's like, I'm great. Everything's fantastic. Like, yep. Everything feel great. Move, you know, like I, I don't even know what all they do, but you know, they would probably jack themselves up with all kinds of anti-inflammatories and, 
do whatever they had to to feel great for that you know for that hour so they so they could just get passed on um but of course they have problems they just they're not willing to talk about them because they think they're going to get disqualified so you know me being a me being a seal they trusted me uh well that that probably wasn't enough but i i'd been a seal recently enough to where there were a lot of there are a lot of seals at the at that command that i was at who i had been a seal with who i'd been through seal training with i'd been in platoon with i deployed with um and so you know those guys trusted me i had a good reputation with them and so they'd come talk to me and say hey let me tell you what's really going on they come in you know peek behind the door, shut the door, sit down and go, Hey, let me tell you what's really going on. Like in a whisper voice. Right. Um, and they're like, uh, you know, my motivation just really sucks right now. And they're, <clears throat> they're seals. They're still getting up. They're still doing it. They're still doing their job. Right. They're not going to curl up and ball and suck their thumb, but like, they don't feel like doing it. It's drudgery. Every moment of their day is drudgery. Uh, body composition shift. They're working with the nutritionist. They're working with the strength and conditioning coach. They're doing everything just right. And they're getting fatter and they're getting weaker. They're losing muscle. They're really moody. They're short with their kids. They're short with their wives. They're snappy at work. They're getting in conflict all the time at work. Uh, they're super emotional. Like they go from really angry to like depressed to really sad, like super fast all over the place sex drives down they ache all the time like every joint in their body aches they can't remember anything they're like their focus is just gone they can't think of words they're trying to say when they're talking they walk in a room they're like i don't remember why i walk in the room i turn around i walk back out i remember i turn around and walk back in i forget again i do this like four or five times and they'll just be like I, but i don't know doc maybe i'm just getting old right and i'm like yeah, you're 32. I mean, it's over, right? Like just <laughs> might as well start digging your grave now. You're old. Um, but honestly, I didn't have any idea because I was a Western trained medical physician. And primarily I was like a sports medicine ortho guy. Like I, I knew like carpentry work for the body. I like, uh, you know, but all I'd learned in medical school is how to, you know, in medical school and uh, residencies, like all I, all I'd ever learned is how to recognize diagnose and treat disease and these guys didn't have any diseases right because even though they're saying these things about themselves like by their assessment they're bad and all these things but like what do you think their body composition was compared to the general population right they're still really lean very muscular very athletic very capable guys compared to everybody else but by their standards, they're not performing how they should, right? And so their motivation sucking is still probably, their motivation is still probably twice as good as most people's motivation, but it's still sucky for them, right? So, um, you know, I just listened. I was like, I don't know, well, I'll take a bunch of notes, I'll listen. And then another guy would come in and tell me the same story. Another guy would come in and tell me the same story. Another guy would come in and tell me the same story. And I'm like, I don't know, man. Like, I, uh, I don't know. Um, but I'll listen. And I, you know, started going, well, let me just, anytime I had an idea, like, okay, well, let me check. And so, you know, if I had 20 guys who had already come to my office and I came up with an idea, I'd call all 20 of them and say, Hey, can you go do this test? Like, I'm thinking maybe it has something to do with this. And then when I had a hundred guys, if I came up with a new idea, I'd be like, send a hundred guys over there to do the test. Um, and I just started kind of shotgun approach, like just testing everything I could possibly think of. I thought, you know, this is eight years of combat. Maybe it's like that shell shock or combat fatigue or all these sort of nebulous things you've heard of in other wars. I didn't really know what those things were, but maybe it was that, whatever that is. Um, that that kind of led me down the road uh, of looking into more to like integrative functional medicine stuff. Um, Cause that's really root cause uh, performance based stuff and a lot of lifestyle stuff and a lot of nutritional stuff and not so much medicine disease type things. Um, so I'm like, all right, well, maybe, you know, maybe there's some adrenal insufficiency here. Like, you know, they're just, they're just running around with, too, you know, too much, too much adrenaline all the time. They've been running off their adrenals for eight years and their adrenals are just kind of shutting down. So I'm doing adrenal support stuff for them and uh, like, you know, uh, something called Myers cocktails, which are like IV vitamins and minerals, essentially, um, you know, giving them some uh, supplements to improve adrenal function, taking over their adrenal function by giving them cortisol for a couple of weeks. Uh, you know, uh, 
they all turned out to have vitamin D3 deficiency. And that was kind of at the beginning of the big craze of vitamin D3 deficiency. So I'd given them that. Um, yeah. And, but what I was finding when I was doing their labs, when I started shotgunning their approach was they all had low testosterone. They all had low growth hormone. They all had low thyroid function. They all had poor insulin sensitivity. They all had high inflammation and high oxidation. And if I would have given those labs to a colleague of mine and said, tell me how old you think this guy is and what he looks like. And they would have said, he's 55 to 60 years old. He's 30 to 40 pounds overweight and he's got metabolic syndrome. He's pre-diabetic. And I'd say exactly wrong. He's 28 years old. He has six pack abs. He's in great physical condition. He eats a perfect diet da, 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 like this. And again, I didn't know, uh, but I was looking, I was in a great position though, because the seals again, 2009, the seals have already killed bin Laden. They already have this, you know, quasi celebrity status and, uh, I can read a book. I can go to a conference, see somebody lecture, watch somebody's Ted talk. I can call them on the phone and say, Hey, I'm the doctor for the West coast seal teams. I read your book. I saw your lecture, whatever. And I was wondering if I could talk to you about some problems we're having here. Maybe I could consult with you. Maybe I can train with you. Every single person said yes, like overflowing, like overly jealous, uh, overly uh, generous. And I was like, <clears throat> great. So I got to learn a lot really quickly. Um, and again, I was, ch I was chasing um, adrenal, uh, essentially adrenal overuse kind of thing, like just living too high of a stress, too high stressful lifestyle for too long. Um, and then I, I remember, I don't remember how many patients had been in my office, but I remember the day it happened. I remember I was wearing my khakis, which is really rare. I hardly ever wore khakis, uh, had my legs crossed, had my, had this guy's chart on my, on my knee. He was talking to me and he said something about using Ambien <clears throat> to sleep. And I thought, it seems like a lot of guys have said that. Now that I think about it, so I put a little note in the margin, like, you know, to remind myself to check. And then I just go on with the interview. I talk to him for however long. I do whatever I can do for him. I give him whatever ideas I have. Uh, if I'm like a back from him, I send him out. And then I start going through all my shadow files. Because again, now these guys want this stuff in the records. Just like, I'm going to keep all this stuff. When I leave, I'm going to give them all their shadow files. They can put it in the record. If they want to, right? like, so that's the way we're going to work this out. Uh, Cause I'm not, I'm not disqualifying anybody. Um, and so uh, I go back through the shadow files and every single guy who'd been in my office was taking Ambien. Every single guy. And so I went and talked to uh, the department head of medical and I said, you know, all these guys come in my office. And, you know, I wasn't super elaborate with them what was going on, but I was like, all these guys come in my office and they're all taking Ambien. I was like, what's the deal with the Ambien? He's like, oh, Ambien, you know, it's a totally benign drug. You know, these guys travel all the time. They're crossing time zones all the time. You know, uh, training cycles, they're having to work at night sometimes, daytime sometimes. So like, we just give them, we give them a ton of Ambien and they can just use it when they, you know, there's no side effects to it. It's not habit forming, it's a good drug. And I was like, all right, like, whatever, let me go look into that. Um, but again, Western trained medical physician, I didn't know anything about sleep. Uh, I could have, you could have grabbed my gardener, uh, grabbed me and said, tell me everything you know about sleep. And we probably would have known about the same amount. Like I zero, I didn't knew nothing about sleep. I don't know what happens when you go to sleep. I don't know what's supposed to happen. Uh, I'd taken pharmacology. I knew what ambient was. I knew the mechanism of action, right? I knew that it was a GABA analog, which means it acts like GABA. Uh, but I honestly didn't know what GABA was supposed to be doing. <laughs> so I was like, I don't really know. Like, okay. I think it helps sleep because it acts like GABA and GABA is important for sleep. Why? I don't know. Um, so let me learn a little bit about sleep. Now, the problem with the pharmaceutical industry is when they go for FDA approval, they give the FDA the research, right? The FDA doesn't do the research, they give them the research. So the pharmaceutical industry does the research on their own product, and then they get to cherry pick. They get to give the FDA what they want to give the FDA. 
And so they give them the most flattering research they have and they they build their case for how why they want to use this drug and how much they want to use and this is how much and this is why we're going to use it this is going to be the you know these are going to be the indications for it these are going to be the risk for it like, like this is all the research and the fda approves it based on what they have in front of them now fortunately this is right around the time that um those are called z drugs like ambien and lunesta these are z drugs we can talk about what that means a little more in a second um but these uh, Z drugs have started getting sued in, in court uh, successfully or getting sued because people were taking these drugs and getting in their cars and going to casinos and gambling away their life savings or driving down the street and picking up hookers and uh, doing all sorts of crazy stuff, right? Um, and they would have zero recollection of it. And these people would swearing up and down, like, I do not remember getting in my car. I don't remember driving there. I don't remember going into the ATM, like, I don't remember any of this stuff. And so then, you know, when they started getting sued, they had to cough up all of the research. And lo and behold, they knew this. They knew that it was causing a dissociation. They knew that it was causing these big amnestic periods where people weren't remembering anything they were doing. They also knew that it only made people fall asleep on average 13 minutes faster, and that it made people sleep on average 37 minutes longer, but it, de it destroyed the quality of sleep so much that you would actually get more sleep if you didn't take the sleep drug. Um, and so that was enough for me to want to get people off. Um, but as I learned more and more about sleep and I understand how it decreased the uh, efficacy of your sleep, I it, it you know, once you learn what's going on during sleep and you understand how this is messing with what's going on when you're asleep, then you can say, okay, well, that could cause this symptom and it could cause this symptom. If that's happening, it could cause this symptom. So all these guys that were, every single complaint that these guys were coming to my office with could have been explained by poor sleep. Um, and including right, including the low testosterone and the low growth hormone and the low thyroid hormone and the low insulin sensitivity and high inflammation and how like all of the objective measures could be explained by poor sleep. And then all of the symptoms they're complaining about could be uh, explained by poor sleep. Now, I wasn't naive enough to think that it would be the, the solution for everybody, but it would at least made sense to get people off of the sleep drug. So the unfortunate thing about getting people off of sleep drugs <laughs> is that they're taking sleep drugs because they can't sleep. So you can't just take it away and say, go sleep anyway, right? Um, so I had to come up with something else. So uh, I worked hand in hand with the guys that, that had come to see me and that we were trying to get off of. And together, like with the help of the, these guys were, I mean, these guys were pulling research articles for me sometimes about different supplements and they were, um, you know, going to different, uh, health food stores around San Diego and finding out like what was available and talking to people. And, all this. and we came up with this concoction of about like seven different supplements. And then we worked over the course of a couple of months to figure out like what was the right amount of each one of these things to take. And then we got people sleeping without, without sleep drugs. And then lo and behold, when we got them sleeping without sleep drugs, their testosterone went up by three, 400%. Their growth hormone doubled and tripled. Their insulin sensitivity doubled. Their inflammation became undetectable. Their oxidation dropped in half. Their thyroid function came back. Their adrenal functions came back. Their mood, like all their mood issues went away. The, like the motivation issues got better, like all of this stuff. You know, and again, it wasn't a hundred percent cure for a hundred percent of the people, but it was huge. It was huge. It was like 85% solution for 85% of the guys, like it was the best therapeutic thing you could ever imagine. Um, now, of course, I was a Western trained medical physician. So before, before we got into that, what I wanted to do was just fix it, right? Like, well, they're low on testosterone, we'll give them testosterone. Their thyroid is low, we'll give them thyroid. Their insulin sensitivity is low, we'll give them like a type two diabetic drug that's going to improve their insulin sensitivity. Like, that's what I wanted to do. Now, intellectually, I knew I couldn't do that because that would disqualify them. You can't give somebody a medication that they're dependent upon and then have them do the job of a SEAL. What if they can't get their medication? <laughs> like, right. you know, they're, they're, out, they're out in the field, they're out in the combat zone for a while, they can't get medication, now they can't do their job anymore. That's, that's a no-go. Um, 
So that's what I wanted to do. I couldn't. So I was really relieved when this little experiment worked better than I thought it would. And so then I, I, I mean, I'm just like, got sparkles flying out of my head. I'm so excited about this. And I'm running around to all the leadership offices and going around to all the CEOs. I'm saying, hey, there's, there is a crisis at the SEAL team and it's sleep, right? right? And, and I mean, come on, this is an organization that part of the screening process is you go a week without sleep. These are not people who value sleep. These are not people who think sleep is important. And, uh, and I didn't want to talk about the soft stuff, right? I didn't want to talk about motivation and mood and memory and cognition and attention and all that other stuff. That's all very subjective. I want to talk about the labs. I'm like, look, testosterone, growth hormone, THEA, thyroid, uh, insulin sensitivity, inflammation, oxidation. They know what these things are. They, they know what those should be. They, and they're still SEALs, even though they're, they're COs, they're still SEALs. They still consider themselves SEALs and like they, they still need to be capable and they still want to be strong and they still want to be athletic. And so they see all this stuff. They know this stuff, but they, they thought I was crazy. I literally thought I was crazy. Like, like this guy's a quack. Like, uh, um, I, I mean, I, I remember no hyperbole, four guy, four guys in the office, uh, a CEO and XO, a master chief and a, and a senior corpsman laughing me out of the office, like cracking up, hysterically laughing, saying, yeah, doc, I think you need to go back to medical school. <laughs> like, yeah, people's hormones are bad because they're not sleeping. Right. Okay. Uh, and, you know, and in fairness to them, there wasn't any information about that anywhere, anywhere that wasn't out there. Um, a few little obscure, strange things on PubMed if you dug deep enough, but there weren't people, people weren't talking about sleep. Uh, people weren't talking about sleep hygiene. This is before the kind of the big media craze around sleep. And um, after like a few of them bought in and then uh, they would let me work with their guys and they'd have great results. And then we had these pre and post retreats for the SEALs. So before the SEALs would deploy, we'd take the SEALs and their families out to a resort spend three days out there, give them a bunch of classes about like, here's what you're going to experience when you're deployed and here are the resources for your family when you're deployed, here are the resources for you when you're deployed, blah, blah, blah. Like these are the, these are the trials and turbulations of being an employee seal and things you're going to go through. And, and we'd bring in guest lecturers to bring in like uh, Lieutenant Colonel or uh, uh, yeah, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Grossman on, like on killing and uh, to talk about the psychology of this for you know the new guys who haven't been deployed yet and they haven't been in combat yet um, it would bring in uh, you know people who could talk about uh, the trials and tribulations of the wife you know if they're being scared with their husband deployed and da, 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 and when he could die it's dangerous um, we bring in people to talk about nutrition like you're trying to take care of yourself when you're over there people to talk about smart periodization with your workouts you know we bring in and, you know, we kind of wanted a little celebrity status around it. So it wasn't just like the guy down the hall from them telling them something that they tell them all the time. Like you wanted to, like some sort of somebody with some panache. And so we would hire these uh, people who were really well known. Um, and in those days, it was guys like Rob Wolf and Chris Kresser and John Wellborn and um, uh, Chris Masterton and, you know, like all, like all these sort of well-known health and wellness thought leaders in, at the time. And we, and they'd give all these lectures. And of course they, they would pay these guys, but they had me for free <laughs> because that like, I'm the So they're like, well, you're going to go talk about sleep. And so I would be, I would get up there and I would talk about sleep and hormones, um, about 80% of the lecture and about 20% of the lectures, I talked about nutrition. And then Rob Wolf would go up there and he'd lecture about nutrition and about 20% of the lecture, he talked about sleep. And so Rob Wolf and I ended up, you know, hitting it off. And then I got to be friends kind of with everybody on the stages. And they all had podcasts and they were all doing health symposiums all over the world. And they started inviting me to do lectures that they were at. And I was taking leave and going and doing lectures and I was going on podcasts. And uh, it just led to me becoming the sleep guy. And, um, and, and, you know, it's, it's about, 30% of what I do as a physician, <laughs> but it's uh, about probably 95% of the people who know of me know, know of me because of sleep. Um, you know, but when I work with clients, I, you know, I do sleep, nutrition, exercise, and mindfulness, stress mitigation, whatever you want to call that kind of the last pillar. 
Um, and I work on lifestyle and hormones and peptides and supplements and nutrition and like all that stuff when I, when I work with people. But, um, you know, I just became the sleep guy and I just got hired after lecture after lecture, law enforcement, DOD, DOJ, you know, whatever, professional sports teams, college teams, trucking companies, you know, whatever, like anybody who had an interest in, um, you know, the, either the performance or the safety around sleep, you know, like the, obviously the trucking industry and airlines and, you know, all that, it, you know, it's uh, shipping, all of that stuff, uh, you know, sleep's a big issue around safety, you know, workplace safety and uh, accidents and all that other stuff. And then uh, the, you know, all these, the sports teams and um, LEOs and DOJ and all that stuff, they're, they're more interested in like performance, longevity and all that stuff. But um, yeah, I mean, that, that ended up being, you know, ended up being my career. So, and, uh, and I, and when I left the SEAL teams, obviously I left this vacuum right? because uh, they were just going to get another doctor who was just like a doctor, right? You're just going to go in there and do the sick call stuff and just do doctor, doctor stuff. Um, and all the SEALs kept haranguing me to make a product out of the sleep supplement because they're, you know, this is pre Amazon being a real thing, you know, so they were having to drive around all these different stores to buy this stuff and you know, this was in a 90 day supply and that was a 30 day supply. And this was a powder and that was a liquid. And these were capsules and it was, you know, cumbersome, hard to travel with. And they're like, just make a product, just make a product, make a product. So I kept trying to work with companies to like make a product for me. Um, but the supplement industry is a really smarmy industry. And um, I just couldn't find anybody that I trusted or wanted to work with. So I was like, you know, I'll take, I, I I did a year of brick and mortar practice in, in California, the first year I got on the Navy. I was like, you know, I'll take a year off of brick and mortar. I'll just do virtual consulting and then I'll, I'll build this supplement out. I'll sell it to the SEAL, you know, like I'll, I'll build up a, a supply chain where I can sell it to, to, you know, SOCOM or whatever. And like, and, and it, if it makes if it makes a nickel fine you know, like if it pays for itself that's fine too like just really just for the guys um and then and then rob wolf got involved with it and he wanted to be a partner in it and he said you know let's launch it at paleo fx and so it's a big health symposium so we launched it there and turned into this huge business all of a sudden like six years later you know i'm still running that and still doing virtual practice you know so real quick um for the people who don't know when you look at sleep in terms of total health, how important do you consider sleep on that scale? It is um, not only the most important aspect of your health, it is exponentially more important than anything else. If you could only optimize one thing in your life, it would be, it would be optimizing your, your sleep wake schedule, your sleep wake cycles and schedules. So, um, I think most people know when you work out, they like say like, if you lift weights, as an example, you don't get stronger when you lift weights, right? Most people understand that. You get weaker when you lift weights because you're damaging the tissues. You're, the whole idea is to do more work with those cells than they're capable of doing. And when you push them past their limits, they actually get damaged. And if you really push them back to the limit, you actually kill them. You actually rupture muscle cells. Um, uh, you know, this is where, uh, you know, you can get, you can get into trouble with doing, uh, something like CrossFit too heavy. There's something called rhabdomyolysis where you actually have all these proteins from these ruptured muscle cells spilling out into your blood and then they can clog up your kidneys and you can literally die from kidney failure. Um, but you're damaging muscle tissues when you're exercising. And then those muscle tissues don't repair until you sleep. And when you go to sleep, that's when the repair happens. So when you first go to sleep, uh, we, we have something called sleep cycles, right? So when we, uh, and, and so all of this is based off of a lot of data, right? So when you, if you've ever, have you ever had a sleep study done? Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, you have, all these electrodes all over your head, all these wires all over your head. You have a strap around your chest. They're measuring your respiration. You have a pulse ox on your finger. They're seeing 
how saturated is your hemoglobin with oxygen. Uh, it, it, you have some EKG leads that are measuring your heart rate and like, you know, what, what your heart's doing. Um, there's some, uh, there's the electrodes on your skin and so forth. Like, so we're, we're collecting a lot of data. Um, there's some electrodes up here to write, to capture your eye movement and all these electrodes on your head. They're like, they're like, think of it as like a, like the Astrodome, right? And it's like, uh, hanging a bunch of microphones from the roof of the Astrodome. That's what these electrodes are. And they're listening to the crowd below. So it's not a super high resolution. You can't say like, oh, there's that one guy on that seat saying this. It's like kind of a gestalt, right? Like if there's a wave going across, so they're standing up and doing the wave, like you're going to pick this up. You're going to be able to see that essentially with, with these EKGs on the brain. And that's telling us what your brain waves are doing essentially, right? But just like the stadium, not everybody in the stadium is doing the same thing, but like there's an overall pattern and we recognize that overall pattern is going, okay, well, when, when this is the majority of activities doing this, we call that theta brainwave state, whatever, which is stage three sleep. And then there's stage four sleep and they're like, so there's stage one, two, three, and four. And then there's, uh, and then there's REM sleep, which is kind of its own little thing. It's its own little different sleep. So, when you first go to sleep, you go from being awake, you go down into deep sleep, you travel across time at the bottom of slow wave sleep or deep sleep. Um, and I misspoke, look, four is, uh, stage four is, is theta, not, uh, not studio three. Uh, and then you come back up, you actually go past being awake and you go into a little bit of a REM. And then when that ends, we call that one sleep cycle. And that's 90 to 120 minutes. Now, you're going to go from that sleep cycle right into another sleep cycle. And the difference is going to be that the next sleep cycle is going to have less deep sleep and more REM sleep. And then the same thing is going to keep going on so that your first sleep cycle at, at night, uh, when you first go to sleep, that first sleep cycle is going to be about 80%, maybe 90% deep sleep and 10 to 20% REM sleep. By the time you wake up, that last sleep cycle right before you wake up, that's going to be 80 to 90% REM sleep and only 10 to 20% deep sleep. Okay. So you're transitioning through the night. Every sleep cycle is different. So when people say, what happens when you're asleep? I say, what happens when you're awake? Right. A million things happen when you're awake, a million things happen when you're asleep. So you can't just say, it's not like this homogenous situation where they just slip, switch, you're asleep, you wake up. Like it's nothing like that. There's billions of things going on. And one of the most important things is that um, so we have, we have, uh, something called anabolic behavior in our body and catabolic behavior. So anabolic means that we're taking small, simple things and we're building big complex things. Like if I take amino acids and I string them together and proteins in a certain way to where I make a muscle fiber, that's an anabolic behavior. I've taken food that I've eaten, I've taken amino acids that I've eaten, and I've done some work with my body to form that into a muscle fiber. And so that's an anabolic behavior. I've built something. Catabolic behavior means I'm starving. I'm under a lot of stress. I don't have the fuels that I need. My body is going to release some hormones. It's going to cause me to break my muscle fibers down into amino acids and let the amino acids flow around my body to give my cells this amino acids that they need to do their job. So that's catabolic. I'm taking something big and complex, breaking it down into something small and simplistic. So you're always, there's a yin and yang to this. You're always balancing, right? You're anabolic and you're catabolic throughout the day. And, and it's not overall, it's not like you're hundred percent anabolic or hundred percent catabolic. It's like some parts of your body could be anabolic and some parts could be catabolic and, you know, and, but there's a gestalt. Now, the most anabolic time of your life is deep sleep and not by a small margin. When I say the most, the most important, uh, or the, or the most anabolic, I'm talking about 90 to 95% of all anabolic behavior is happening during deep sleep. So if you lose deep sleep, you lose anabolic behavior, which sounds bad, but it gets a lot worse. <clears throat> um, if you think about what is the purpose of sleep, the whole reason I'm going to go to sleep tonight is to recover from today. And right. in recovering from today, my brain and body is going to use today as the template. The 16 hours that I've been awake today, I'm going to go to bed for eight hours. 
I'm going to repair from any damage I did, and I'm going to prep my brain and body to be able to do tomorrow what I did today a little bit better, hopefully. And then I'm going to have some growth, right? I'm going to be a little better. I'm going to get a little improvement every day. Now, if I don't get enough sleep, tomorrow still comes, right? So let's say I get up in the morning and <clears throat> I go out and I do like a really intense workout and I come back and I shower and I do my administrative work and do my docking works and I go out and I work in my yard for several hours and I like maybe I smash my thumb with a hammer at some point, uh, you know, whatever. Like I just, I, you know, you think of the things you would do in a day. And then I go to bed tonight and I have this smashed thumb that needs to be repaired and I have these uh, exhausted muscles that need to be repaired. And maybe I really exhausted my brain. Like maybe I've done a lot of really cognitively intense stuff all day throughout the day. Maybe I didn't eat quite enough. So I like run out of some, some, some storage material, right? So like we, we store uh, uh, fuel as fat and glycogen. Um, glucose can be stored as, as glycogen. You know, maybe I've tapped into some of this. Maybe I've overworked some areas. I have a bunch of waste products built up. And my my brain and my brain's going to recognize all this. My body's going to recognize all this. And when I go to sleep tonight, it's going to do its best to repair all of that so that tomorrow when I wake up, I can do the exact same thing tomorrow a little bit better or at least as easily with maybe a little bit, a little less damage. <clears throat> and that's going to allow me to live longer and prosper longer, right? Um, anabolic behavior though. If I'm undernourished, I can't be anabolic, right? I have to have the right nutrients and I have to have enough nutrients to be anabolic. So if I'm starving, I'm not going to be very anabolic. Now, the other thing I can't have is a lot of catabolic hormones and catabolic hormones are stress hormones. So if I should sleep eight hours tonight to prepare for tomorrow, but I only sleep six hours tonight and I stay up 18 hours and sleep six hours instead of staying up 16 hours and sleeping eight hours, well, tomorrow morning when I wake up, tomorrow's still here. I only got 75% of the recovery that I needed, but tomorrow's still here. So I still have to do tomorrow. How am I going to do it? I'm going to do it with stress hormones. And when I release stress hormones, they're going to be catabolic, right? They're going to break me down. They interfere with my brain activity, interfere with my strength, my endurance, my coordination, my mood, my appetite. Everything about me is impacted by my stress hormones. Maximum amount of stress hormones is fight or flight. You've probably heard of that, right? Right. Fight or flight means there's something that's going to kill you right now. Only thing that matters is getting away from that. Nothing else matters. Nothing matters except getting away from that threat. So my pupils are going to dilate. I'm going to take in a bigger field of vision. My lungs are actually, a bronchial tree is going to dilate so I can take in more air. I can take in more oxygen. I can take deeper breaths. My, my blood glucose, my, all my stored glycogen, it's all going to get dumped immediately out of my liver, out of my muscles, everything. I'm going to get all of this blood glucose into my, or all of this glycogen into my bloodstream so I have really high blood glucose so I can have all the energy I need. My blood pressure is going to go up. Uh, my heart rate is going to go up. My muscle tension is going to go up. You see somebody getting ready to fight. You see him getting stiff. Yeah. This neuromuscular tension. My nervous system is tensing my muscles. My reflexes have gotten faster. My pain threshold has gotten higher. All of the capillaries in my skin have completely contracted so that if I get cut, I'm not going to bleed or hardly bleed at all. So I'm going to be able to run faster, jump higher. I'm going to be, I'm going to have faster reflexes, better vision, better hearing, better sense of smell. Everything is going to be heightened. I'm going to be superhuman. So why don't I run around like that all the time? If I'm capable of doing that, why don't we, why don't we just always do that, right? <laughs> well, we don't always do that because it's catabolic and you can only live for maybe two days like that, probably, and then you die. You just like, you'd essentially just eat yourself. And there's a lot of stuff that isn't happening because again, nothing matters if you don't get away. So it doesn't matter if you can fight off infection or parasites, right? Because if the tiger eats you, doesn't matter if you repair your sprained ankle, doesn't matter if you fight off the bacterial infection, doesn't matter if you digest the food in your stomach, doesn't matter if you, uh, if you secrete reproductive hormones, it doesn't matter 
uh, your liver's functioning. It doesn't matter if your kidney's functioning. It doesn't matter if any of that stuff that is going to sustain your life. None of that stuff matters if you don't get away from the tiger. Now, we also have this area in the front of our head, the area behind our, above our eyes and behind our uh, forehead that's called the prefrontal cortex. That's the area of our brain that makes us the smartest animal on the planet. And that's a simulator. And what it allows us to do is think through things that we don't actually have to try, right? So I could come up with some really stupid idea and say, hey, like, why don't we ride our motorcycles down the street while juggling chainsaws, right? And you don't have to, you don't have to entertain that to know that's a dumb idea. And you're gonna be like, no, I don't want to do that. Because, and you don't have to try it first, right? You just, you can just go, I can simulate that. That's a bad idea, right? For something more simplistic, like your boss pisses you off. You want to flip them off. All right, let me think about how that's going to play out. Nope, it's not going to go in my favor. I'm not going to do it, right? I'm going to go home and I'm going to cuss him out to my friends, right? Um, so th it's our simulator. Well, when we're in fight or flight, that shuts off because you don't want to think when you're in fight or flight. You want to react. It wants you want to be completely impulsive because any thinking takes too long, right? You right. have to react to the situation, and you're going to get away from it. Which is why, uh, which is why combat training matters so much. Which is why you have to do everything ten thousand times because you're not going to think when it actually happens. You know, you if somebody's in a gunfight and you ask them for their phone number probably just shoot you right because they they don't they don't know your they don't know their phone number they don't even know what the hell you're talking about. um because that area of their brain isn't working right they're they're in their lizard brain they're in survival they're in fight or flight so all that shut down now the exact opposite of that is deep sleep so your body's useless your heart rate's low your blood pressure's low your eye you aren't even using your eyes you aren't using your you aren't using any of your real senses right at this at this time you're relaxed you're digesting you're producing reproductive hormones you're producing anabolic hormones you're repairing damaged tissues you're fighting off infection you're flushing out waste products you're storing fuel instead of using fuel you're partitioning things off you're storing fat you're storing some glycogen here you're giving nutrients to all the cells you're getting rid of all the waste products you're getting ready for tomorrow if i don't prepare completely for tomorrow and i wake up with a deficit i'm going to use stress hormones to give me a little more energy to get through the day that's going to impair my brain functioning a little bit right because i'm a little closer to fight or flight like i'm nowhere close to it right like i'm maybe uh five percent closer to fight or flight than I would be ordinarily. Now, stress hormones get about it, a bad rap in that oh, you want no stress hormones. No stress hormones means you're dead, right? Stress hormones actually keep you awake and alert and alive in proportion to your environment. So when you first wake up in the morning, if you go to sleep in a completely dark room and you don't have an alarm clock, and there's no noises or anything to wake you up you're going to wake up if like if if you've been getting good sleep you're going to wake up well you're going to wake up after you've gotten as much sleep as you need really right <clears throat> so if you're if you've been sleeping well for extended period extended period of time it's going to be about eight hours you're going to wake up at about eight hours <clears throat> without anything waking you up right nothing external is waking you up there's no light there's no sound temperature isn't changing nothing's changed why do you wake up we wake up because you're stressful nuts the lowest stress hormones you will ever have is during deep sleep. That first sleep cycle, that hour, hour and a half that you're in deep sleep, you have almost no stress hormones in your body. And you're maximally anabolic. So the exact opposite things that's happening in fight or flight, exactly the opposite. And then every sleep cycle you go through, you've repaired more, you've partitioned off fuel, you've emotionally categorized events, you've taken things from short-term memory to long-term memory, like you, you're again, you're using today as the template to be better for tomorrow. And as you repair, and as your body gets more and more capable, gets closer to being ready for tomorrow, your stress hormones are going to gradually increase to a point of being enough stress hormones to wake you up. So let me ask you, oh, sorry. I was going to ask you this real quick. Um, right now, sleep's kind of becoming a commodity. Uh, I wear an aura ring. People talk about blue light blockers, Apple's advertising. Does any of that data that you get correlate to anything for real? 
Like, do blue light blockers really matter as much as they make them? Or the data I get off my aura ring to what you're saying right now about sleep cycles? Um, there is a correlation, right? It's not, it's not ideal. The aura ring is the most accurate device that I'm aware of. Um, and I, and I'm, I'm friends with Harpreet, the, the founder of it, but I'm not an affiliate. I have no financial interest in it. I think it is a great product. Um, it would be the preferred product, uh, for anyone, for, if, if anyone asked me what they should, what they should have, I would recommend that. Uh, the next, my next choice would be Garmin. Uh, but with all of these things, um, they're comparing you to, uh, an app an i an ideal avatar right so it's it's an algorithm right and so not everybody fits into the algorithm exactly so use them for the gestalt don't chase the number right so you it's the generalization so what you can use it for is consistency so it's great for tracking total time of sleep and it's good for checking it's great for uh tracking uh heart rate variability, which we can talk about that in a minute. Um, uh, and it's reasonably good for figuring out um, if you're like how much deep sleep you're getting. Now, when I say reasonably good, that doesn't mean a whole lot, okay? Because uh, I've, uh, I've, I've had, um, I've had the aura ring tell me that I had 100% of my night deep sleep which is impossible. And I've had it tell me that 0% of my night was deep sleep, which is exceedingly unlikely, uh, right? So um, they're, they're not perfect, but they should work consistently for you, right? And so you can figure out with a little addition to this, right? So you can figure out, so like you wake up and it gives you a sleep score of 80. Uh, and then you, you do just like a little bit of journaling because you're really trying to dial in your sleep. And so, um, you do a little bit of journaling, maybe about like what you ate the day before, what you eat during this day, like how you felt like anything that really stood out to you. And you find out you could, you might find out that all of your best days are a sleep score of 80 and that a sleep score of 90 actually isn't as good for you. Um, and then what you want to do is you want to recreate all of the stuff from the 80s. So the things that you figured out that were associated to your sleep, when you have the best day, you, you'll know that, you know, consistently, this is when I feel the best, even though, or it's giving me a score of 80 instead of 90 or hundred, I know these are my best days. And then, and then you just shoot for that 80 all the time. You try to do those lifestyle things that are making you get that 80 every day. Cause those are the days you're feeling the best. So I, I wouldn't use them as a, as an absolute <clears throat> higher uh, upon higher sort of determination of whether or not you're sleeping well, well, it, it's just, it's a data collecting device that needs to be, it needs to have your, your subjective or whatever objective data you have. Like if you're tracking your workouts or something like that, um, like whatever, whatever objective and subjective data you can put in that's going to make that a lot more powerful. Right. Cause I think some people just, um, and I know I've caught myself doing it, just chasing the numbers. Right. And that's, and that's exactly the wrong thing to do. Right? Yeah. yeah. The thing to do is to chase, to chase the performance and the feeling like, when am I performing well? When am I feeling well? And then what does, what does this device tell me when those things are happening? And I don't, I mean, it's not going to say 20, when you're feeling great but if it did i wouldn't care like if you told me like every time i feel great <laughs> i get a sleep score of 20 and then all these things happen and like i and i've got it tracked out of my journal that i'm better all day and i feel better and here's all the metrics and my workouts are better and my my diet controls better because my appetite's better regulated and i feel better and i'm happier and my wife likes me more and everything else then i think over 20 who cares um and honestly once once you've worn those things, you know, once you've kind of done your research and uh, on yourself, once you've kind of evaluated yourself and followed that for a while, there's very, very little utility to keep using them yeah. to track your, to track your uh, actual sleep. Now, what they are good for is heart rate variability training. Uh, and not training, but heart rate variability monitoring. So, um, <clears throat> like I said, fight or flight, 
stress hormones, deep sleep, opposite, like almost no stress hormones. Um, those are two different parts of what we call the autonomic nervous system. Autonomic, job security word for automatic, right? It just, just means it's, you know, you're not thinking about it. Like it's controlling my heart rate, it's controlling my respiration rate, it's controlling my blood pressure, it's controlling my kidney function, it's controlling my liver function right now. Like I'm not thinking about any of that stuff and it's happening because that's my autonomic nervous system doing it. And it has two branches. It has a sympathetic that speeds things up and has a parasympathetic that slows things down. Okay. Maximum parasympathetic tone is deep sleep, right? Rest and digest. You're recovering anabolic, digesting food, partitioning, getting better, building up, repairing. Maximum sympathetic tone, superhuman, but tearing yourself down, right? Eating yourself to be superhuman. So super fast, super slow. Now I have a node in my heart that outside any influence, as long as I have blood supply to my heart with no hormones and no nerve input, this node in my heart will cause my heart to beat at a certain rate. For most people it's right around 40 beats per minute, right? 40 beats per minute, it's pretty slow. And if I didn't have any input from anywhere, my heart rate would be about 40. Now, if I get a little bit of sympathetic tone in there, a little bit of stress hormones, a little bit of neurotension, so like nerve input from my sympathetic tone, my sympathetic nervous system putting in a little bit of nerve activity, which again, kind of speeding things up, then that will fire my heart before the node has a chance to fire it, right? So if I have a heart rate of 60 and my heartbeat is going on the second, every second for 60 seconds in a row, I have zero heart rate variability, right? didn't vary on the second, every second. That would only occur if I didn't have any input and just my node was falling, just that AB node in my heart was firing. Like that's the only thing that would happen. That's the only way that would ever happen. And that would be 40 and not 60 or 50 maybe. But if I didn't have any input from anywhere, just that node to fire. If I get any sympathetic tone, it can fire it before the node. So if I have a balanced autonomic nervous system, meaning that my sympathetic nervous system and my parasympathetic nervous system are working, they're both doing their job. And one of them is more important for certain function of my body than, uh, than the other one, but they're both doing their job. And so sometimes the sympathetic nervous system causes my heart to beat a little faster. And so it beats a quarter of a second before the second. And then sometimes I don't have any sympathetic tone and my AV node fires itself and it's a quarter of a second after the second, but I still end up with a heart rate of 60, but it might be a quarter of a second before the second quarter of a second after. So it's a half a second variability. That's going to be a heart rate variability of like a hundred, right? That's going to be like the maximum because it's completely balanced. So as I said earlier, if I don't get enough sleep, if I don't recover enough, how do I do tomorrow? what do I do? I didn't repair. I don't have enough fuel. Don't like I'm in a deficit when I wake up, but I still have to do today. How am I going to do it? More stress hormones, sympathetic hormones, sympathetic tone, speed things up, cause me to mobilize my fuel sources, make me feel more energetic, increase my heart rate, give me a little adrenaline and make me a little amped up, make my brain a little more stimulated. That's how I'm going to get through the day when I'm fatigued and not repaired enough. So my heart rate variability is going to be low because my sympathetic tone is going to be firing my heart every time instead of my node firing. I'm going to be sympathetic dominant. That's a bad time to work out. So if I only slept five hours and I wake up in the morning, even if my heart rate's 60 and I have a, and I have a heart rate variability of almost nothing, that means that my sympathetic nervous system is firing the thing the whole time, right? Right. Um, which means that I'm not balanced, which means I'm not repaired. And if I'm not balanced and repaired, I'm catabolic. Why would I work out? If I go and work out, I'm just going to damage myself more. And I'm going to need more stress hormones to get through it. I'm going to be more catabolic and I'm actually, it's counterproductive. Now, when I say work out, I'm talking about goal directed exercise. That's try, driving towards, you know, a certain type of fatigue or certain type of performance. Um, I'm not saying that you shouldn't be active. You should always be active but you just shouldn't, you shouldn't be strenuous. You shouldn't be putting yourself in a deficit and harming yourself and making it harder to get through your day because you're already doing it in a deficit. You're already walking in wasty water 
like don't make it chest deep. No, that makes total sense. So on, on all of this, um, got two other quick topics to hit on. Uh, one, so, uh, one of the reasons why I have you on is I've noticed for the last year that a lot of veteran friends are having trouble sleeping. Um, overall health of some of these guys are going in the toilet because of lack of activity, but drinking is coming way up with a lot of these guys. And I know just from my own health journey that, uh, eating late, uh, looking at the aura ring, eating late, drinking too much. You can watch your HRV trash. You can watch mm. your sleep just go nuts. Yeah. How bad is, or w- let me rephrase that, which is worse having a late meal or drinking too much in terms of how it affects your sleep? Drinking. So uh, the meals vary quite a bit. So there are people who can, who can eat really close to bedtime and then suffer no deleterious effects whatsoever. The biggest issue uh, is because as I told you, when you're in deep sleep, one of the things that you're doing really well is digesting. So if you have food in your digestive tract when you're in deep sleep, that's no problem. Like, you know, that's, that's kind of an ideal time to be digesting and using that fuel. Uh, what, what can cause problems though, is if you've eaten something that's inflammatory to so something that your body doesn't like, and it's gonna have, it's gonna stimulate an immune response to it. If you've over, if you've overfilled yourself, right, to where you're like, now you're running into mechanical problems, which is actually causing some stress on your body because you have too much food to digest, you've overstuffed yourself. But the most likely thing is that you have poor insulin sensitivity. Uh, When you have poor insulin sensitivity, you just have poor blood glucose regulation. When you're, it doesn't matter what your total blood glucose level is. If it changes too rapidly, your body perceives that as a problem. And it'll wake you up. And even if you don't realize it's waking you up, it'll bring you close enough to be waking to where it's destroying your sleep architecture. It's destroying the quality of your sleep, even if you don't feel like it is, even if you don't have any recollection of that. And we see this with pre-diabetics. They have terrible sleep. And diabetics with poorly controlled blood glucose, they have terrible sleep. Um, And and the reason behind that is because the only time any animal on this planet will sleep deprive themselves other than humans, like we'll sleep deprive ourselves by choice, but no other animal on the planet does that. The only other, the only other time a mammal will sleep deprive themselves is when, is when they're being preyed upon, they're being stalked and preyed upon, or if they're starving, right? So when we sleep deprive ourselves, we have hundreds of thousands of years of evolution telling us that we're probably being preyed upon or we're starving to death. So our brain our brain perceives that as a threat and it changes our brains and our behavioral patterns a lot like a starving or preyed upon animal is. So you increase your stress hormones, make yourself really impulsive. So like you think about it, if an animal lives in an area where its food supply is, is gone or nearly gone and it's starving to death, well, it wants to wake up earlier so that it can hopefully get the food before other animals do. And stay up later so that it can travel farther during the day to find more food. And you want the brain to be somewhat impulsive because maybe that food supply is going, going away forever. And you might need to try something new, try something that you've never tried eating before. So you're going to try some novel foods, or you might get really close to humans and go down to, you know, neighborhood houses and eat out of the trash can, whatever it's going to take to survive. The stress hormones are going to push that behavior. So it does, it does the same thing to us. Um, so when we don't get enough sleep, our brain and body are, are convinced that there's, there's danger around or we're starving and our, and our, uh, our physiology responds like that. Right. And so our insulin sensitivity is low because our stress hormones are high. Any change in blood glucose makes it easy for us to wake up. And then during the day, any of those changes in blood glucose, lead to further stress hormones because it's like it's an immediate feeling of it's an immediate sensation to the brain of starvation kicking in because your blood glucose dropped 100 points even if it drops from 400 to 300 and now that's going to shut off my prefrontal cortex even more it's going to make me dumber it's going to make me more impulsive it's going to make me feel more anxious because i'm going to have a lot of stress hormones and be running off a lot of adrenaline 
And then when I'm trying to go to sleep at night, if I'm running around with high stress hormones all the day, I don't have, my stress hormones aren't low enough to get to sleep. So I'm going to try to do things like drink, <laughs> maybe decrease my stress by eating a lot, right? Like, uh, like if I'm an emotional eater and like that, it'll settle me down and it'll settle anybody down. If you eat enough food, it causes the parasympathetic nervous system to kick in. It'll settle you down and you'll feel like going to sleep a little earlier. Um, you still might get crappy sleep, but you know, uh, you'll at least get some sleep. <clears throat> and, but then, like I said, the, the, the neuroregulation of your appetite's off. So you're going to crave different foods. Your willpower is going to be down. You're going to you know, like, you, um, because this is like a survival, um, a, a survival situation for your brain. It's like a pattern that you, that you're, you know, hundreds of thousands of years of evolution has taught this body that, that this is a dangerous time. And so we want to, we want to engage in different behaviors. And then that's counterproductive to most of what we do these days, right? Because we already have plenty of stress. We don't need excess stress hormones. Most of us don't live anywhere close to any deficits in food. It'll just make us eat um, starvation foods. And when you're starving, all that matters is fuel right now, right? So fuel right now, the keep me alive right now, the closer to glucose, the better, because that's what my body can use. So if I could just eat sugar, that would be great because that that'll give me immediate fuel. And then the other thing I need when I'm starving is because we don't know how long this starvation is going to last. I need a bunch of fat because I can store that fat and then I can use that when I'm on a lot of glucose. And so you crave sugar and you crave fat. And in America, we came up with a great idea said, Hey, let's just fry some sugar. Let's just fry some sugar, uh, right? Fry, fry some sugar and some fat. And that's oh, yeah. what a donut is. And that's why when you're sleep deprived and you're living, you know, like when you live in this American hard charging lifestyle where you're not getting enough sleep, you know, 90% of your life, you, you wake up in the morning and you eat sugar and fat. So you eat donuts and you, you haven't gotten rid of all the waste products in your brain. One of the waste products is adenosine, which is caused by uh, breaking down ATP or energy source. You break that down to adenosine. Adenosine makes you feel tired. Caffeine blocks adenosine receptors. You drink coffee and you eat fried sugar and you feel like you can go conquer the day. Um, but it's very, it's very counterproductive. Um, but back to your point, um, alcohol will destroy uh, deep sleep. That's the most anabolic part. Um, get, it, it, will, it will rid you of about 80% of deep sleep um, and about 20% of REM sleep. <clears throat> sleep drugs will reduce deep sleep by about 20% and REM sleep by about 80%. So if you take alcohol and sleep drugs, you essentially get zero sleep, which is what I saw with the SEALs. I'd send the SEALs in to get sleep studies done and they would have 99.9% .9 stage two sleep, which you'll notice I didn't mention when we were talking about sleep because that's not a restorative uh, part of sleep. That's what we call transition. So it's like transitioning from being awake to being in, in uh, asleep and then transition from deep sleep into REM sleep, it goes through stage two sleep, but that's not really restorative uh, part of sleep. Um, so you'll notice that your heart rate goes up. If you take one alcoholic drink, that's a toxin, right? It's a toxin to your body. So, and I'm not telling people not to drink. I'm just saying, be aware of what's going on, right? So uh, you take one alcoholic drink, you go to bed, you have this toxin floating around your bloodstream, your liver processes it essentially to formaldehyde, your embalming fluid you put in dead people, right? Um, this toxin floats around your brain until it's processed out by your kidneys into your bladder and they'll urinate them out. But the whole time you have that, anytime there's a toxin in your body, it doesn't matter if it's venom from a snake bite or you know toxin from bacteria that are proliferating in your body and causing an infection or toxins from something you drink or toxins from something you eat your immune system responds to it. And when your immune system responds to things, it's, it takes a lot of energy. And, and when it takes a lot of energy, it's doing things that you shouldn't be doing maybe at that point of your, of your night of sleep, and it's going to affect your sleep. Um, stress hormones are always released under any type of stress and being poisoned is a stress. So if, you, if you'll notice, you take one alcoholic drink before you go to bed and you track your sleep your heart rate will probably be about 10 beats oh, yeah. per minute faster for the entire night. Yeah. And I, I can tell you, I drank five beers last night and my stuff was all over the place. I think I had a 13 on my score for HRV. 
58, 60 heart yeah. rate overnight. So yeah, I can t- completely understand that. And it's weird though, because I took all of June off from drinking and my deep sleep scores were trashed compared to compared to the nights I do drink on the aura. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> one, one, one drink of any type. Um, beer is a little worse for me because I'm, <clears throat> I'm getting more and more gluten intolerant as I get older. Um, but uh, one drink of any type, like I said, raises my heart rate at least 10 beats per minute. So um, I'm not saying I never do it, but I just have to recognize that it, I'm not getting quite as good to sleep. Yeah. I'm going to sleep a little bit longer and take it a little easier the next day, even if I feel fine. So, so what are the other things I hear for veterans um, is nightmares or dreams? And I don't know whether you really touch on um, not the meaning of dreams, but how dreams affect your sleep. Um, does the more vivid a dream that you remember in the morning have anything to do with the quality of sleep you got the night before? Yeah, and that that was actually going to be my my answer. Uh, more than um, dreams affecting your sleep, I would say that sleeps are affect sleeps affecting the quality of sleep is affecting your dreams. Um, so, if you remember, I said earlier that <clears throat> the first sleep cycle is primarily deep sleep, a little bit of REM sleep. And then throughout the night that reverses the last sleep cycle is almost all REM sleep, very little deep sleep. If you wake up, so you dream throughout the whole night, uh, the vivid dreams that you think of when you think about dreams are things that are in color, that are action, that have action in them, that even if they're nonsensical, like there's a lot going on in them that you're, you're recognizing. Um, that's happening during REM sleep. If you wake somebody up during a REM sleep, they'll remember their dream really well. If you wake some uh, wake somebody up during deep sleep, they don't remember their dreams very well. So if you're waking up too early, or if your sleep architecture just isn't that great, and you're you're not reliably in REM sleep in the morning, you might not be waking up during REM sleep. And if you're not waking up during REM sleep, you're not going to remember your dreams. You're dreaming every night, whether you recognize it or not. But if you have too high of stress hormones, the REM, your brain is actually more active during REM sleep than it is when you're awake in a, lot of, in a lot of cases. So if you have high stress hormones, the difference between being awake and being asleep is kind of nebulous because you have enough stress hormones to keep you awake, but you still have like the right brain patterns to be in REM sleep. And so that kind of blend between those things makes d- distorts the uh, reliability of those dreams and the memories of those dreams because you're kind of bouncing between being awake and being asleep and being awake and being asleep and being like and you're kind of doing this like maybe every other second you're like kind of flip flopping around and so the 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 morning quality when your stress hormones are getting higher um, to wake you up in the morning maybe they've gone up you know, they've gone higher than they needed to, to wake you up, but you're still tired and you're still trying to keep sleeping. So then there's like a mismatch between your stress hormones and your sleep architecture. And, the, and those, and those points, the, you know, the sleeps, the, the dreams might be more fragmented, less vivid because you're bouncing between being awake and, and REM sleeping. Whereas if you had lower stress hormones, you would be legitimately asleep having this very profound visual experience of this dream and then enough hormones would come to wake you up and you would remember kind of that last bit um but the the meaning of dreams or whether or not dream uh more vivid more memorable dreams connote or denote uh better sleep that's up for grabs that I don't think that anybody really knows that that's kind of up for opinion we don't we can't say for sure oh you dreamt a lot so you slept really well because some people can dream a lot and sleep like crap and some people can sleep great and not really remember their dreams um sorry 
my, my hey, I only have about I only have about nine more minutes because I have another call. No, no problem. I was actually going to okay. wrap this up. So I wanted to thank you for coming on. Um, hope if you're willing to come on again uh, at a future point, we can talk about the last year's pandemic and what you've seen with people. Yeah, seeing. I'm I'm more than I'm more than happy to come on again. Yeah, like I, did, I, I, I it, it's hard it's hard to get everything done in an hour or two when yeah. there's so much. I didn't realize we've been recording for two hours and 35 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Doc, thanks so much for coming on. It means a lot. Yeah. I, I, I like I said, I truly appreciate it. Um, anytime somebody will give me a soapbox to stand on and spend my, st spend my tells and uh, I, I appreciate it. So, Hey, can, um, can you let people know how to find you and, um, where they can get your product? Yeah. So, um, my my website it, you know doc short for doctor d o c and then my last name is parsley like the herb so p a r s l e y so it's just docparsley.com um on there you can go to the shop you can find my website or, or that's my website you can go to the shop you can find the supplement on there um the uh you know i have lectures on there a podcast on there i have uh blogs on there you can download i have a have some PDFs to like help with nighttime routines for kids or uh, to help you get rid of stress when you're asleep or things like that. There's eBooks. I think you can download my Kindle. My, my, uh, my Amazon book is on Kindle. I think you can get that off there. A lot of resources there. Um, this, the product, the sleep product is called sleep remedy uh, and uh, sleepremedy.com takes you directly to the shop which is just a page on the doc parsley site so uh, either way you can you can do that if you just want to go straight to the supplement and look at that sleepremedy.com if you want to look at listen to any more uh my my babblings you can go to uh, docparsley.com perfect well doc thanks for coming on yeah man my pleasure <laughs>